the circus trying to find us out. But if you're looking for the truth, you to find it out. There's a can't go to space, so we hit the roof. Get it hit the roof. And it all came to light with 200 proofs. Oh. Now I'm just really sick of people lying to me. So when I tell the truth, don't comply to me. Pick up the phone, get on the line with me. Line with me. Who you gonna call? Who you gonna call? And welcome, everybody, to Globebusters. Why do astrophysicists ignore physics? That's a great question, isn't it? I'm your host, Bob Xanadude60, and we are back with another great show for you today. Have a great guest on today and an interesting, talk to, bleh, interesting topic to talk about, I think. And uh, we'll be uh, moving forward to that here shortly. But uh, the, the reason I chose... Uh, today's title is because there's been some very interesting uh, videos that have come up, uh, specifically the one that you're seeing playing on your video now. And uh, this video was absolutely fascinating. I, I decided to mirror it two days ago. And it is talking about all the different motions and, and how, uh, you know, we've been told by mainstream science that we shouldn't be able to, to feel these motions or anything like that. And uh, this gentleman here that, that created this video um, has actually gone through, done the math, documented it uh, with physics lectures, the whole nine yards, um, and saying that we absolutely should be able to feel these motions. And of course, we on Globebusters have been saying this for quite some time, but it goes so much further than that. Uh, it's not just the motions and all this stuff that they ignore. Uh, it's how they are constantly creating new physics and, and you know, trying to explain away things that uh, are simply unexplainable, uh, especially from their point of view. So we're going to delve into that today, and uh, hopefully you're going to enjoy it. But we also have a, another gentleman with us today that uh, we're going to be looking at his uh, documentary movie, which is absolutely fabulous. Um, and that documentary is called What If the Earth Is Flat? And um, I got to tell you, I watched it this week. I, I think it's one of the best documentaries out there. And uh, I'm really excited to talk to the gentleman that made it. But before we get to that, let's go ahead and introduce our co-host today. And uh, first up, as always, we have Jaron from Jaronism. How are you doing today, Jaron? Yeah, I did too, for sure. But we're up to a whopping 57 degrees here in Denver. And ironically, we are actually forecast to have snow on Thursday. Um, but before we have that, we're going to be in the 80s. <laughs> so only in Colorado. Um, well, yeah, since last year. Um, but uh, yeah, well, I don't know. Well, maybe earlier this year, you know, winter. But uh, yeah, it's been a while since we've had snow, but it'll be the first snow of the season. And uh, it may have snowed in the mountains, I don't know, but, um, you know, it's Colorado, so we expect things like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no kidding. Uh, whoops, wait a second. Wow, they're saying, they're telling me they can't hear you talking, Jaron, that's bizarre. Uh, all right, say something. Oh, sure enough, we're not getting you. Let's see what's going on. All right, guys, hang on a second. I'm aware of the problem now. It's always got to be something, doesn't it? Let's see if I can. I know, that is weird. Uh, okay, we're working it, guys. Hang on just a second. Uh, well, Jake's on the same audio circuit, so I doubt it. All right, say something now. Nope. You know what? This is probably going to be one of those cases where I have to restart OBS. So let me kill OBS and then I will restart it. 
Sorry, guys. Well, it'll it'll cut the stream for a second, and then when we start streaming, it'll come back online. So let me try it. All right. Say something, Jordan. Oh, well, we are not. Oh, you know what it is. I bet I know what it is. All right, guys, we should be back on. I think I know what the problem is. Hang on just a second. Oh, it's always something I'm telling you. Let's see. I know. It, yeah, it's just not possible. So let's go to settings and let's go to audio and video. Yep, there's my problem. All right, so we will go panel in. And, uh, yeah, well, no, I actually did it. <laughs> oh, it's my we blame okay, Bob? Now you should have. There you go. Now we gotcha. Am I here? Yep. I Yeah, I see you on my panel. We should be hearing. I'm checking uh, the chat to see. Okay, Somebody guys. Says, <laughs> can you hear us now? Somebody says you should have let Jaron MC the show. No, there would have been much more audio <laughs> issues than just that mere five minutes. Hi, <laughs> caramba. Yeah. All, All right. right. Um, we talked about the weather a little bit. Uh, I don't remember what we said. No, that's it. I'm back yep. from Amsterdam. So uh, happy to be here. I checked out Jake's documentary. Very excited about it. It was a great three hours. It's not very often you can enjoy, uh, you know, something that's three hours long. So that's, you know, good for me. And uh, that's about it. I said I've been a bit under the weather, but kind of turning the corner. So things are better. I did get Missa sick, though, which is not very kind of me. But uh, besides that, all is good. I think everybody can hear me now. All right, good. Sorry about yep, that. Folks. Everybody can hear you. Yep, my bad, guys. I had my, I had my Skype setting uh, direct to my uh, microphone, and it was not on the virtual audio cable. And it's got to be on the virtual audio cable to be shared everywhere. But, uh, you know, I won't bore you with those technical details, but it was definitely <laughs> my fault. Bob, <laughs> uh, solo show. Yep. Yep. I was, I was pulling a Jaren. <laughs> All right. Oh, no, it's true. I can't, I can't even say anything when you say that. Cause it's like very. <laughs> All right. Okay guys. So um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our, now that we have all the technical issues worked out, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our guest, uh, Mr. Jake Grant from the now you see TV channel. Uh, Jake is the uh, creator of the documentary. What if the earth is flat? And uh, Jake, we're really happy to have you on. Welcome. Yeah, it's fantastic to be here, guys. Okay. Do you uh, do you go through technical problems like this on your channel occasionally? All the time. You know, <laughs> sometimes it you just can't get catch a break. It's <laughs> one thing after the other, and the worst is uh, audio because uh, people can uh, watch a video that might be a little blurry, but if the sound's bad then people usually click off. So I'm glad we got things up and running, and it's good to be here. Yep, awesome. Excited. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. So, um, well, guys, if you are not familiar with uh, Now You See TV, um, he has been around for quite some time. You do uh, a lot of work with John Pounders also on that uh, channel, right, Jake? Yes, I've been with Now You See TV for about two and a half years. Uh, we do a whole host of different conspiracy uh, topics. We get into uh, different aspects of secret societies and occult, and, and we look at uh, different topics through a biblical lens in a lot of our, our research and our interviews. Uh, but it's just an overall uh, great channel to be a part of. Uh, we have probably uh, close to a thousand videos out, most of them over two hours long of various interviews over year, uh, over the years that we've conducted. And uh, yeah, and that's how long I've been with them. It's been a great ride. I got a question, Jake. How, how many people um, are a part of that channel as far as creators, as far as the team that uh, is able to put out, you know, almost a video a day? Yeah, well, it's just uh, three guys right yeah. now. And of course, uh, it's John who started the channel several years ago, and then it really started to take off about three and a half, four years ago. And uh, I came along full time as his full, first uh, employee and part of Now you See TV as a partner. And then just recently, we had John Hall uh, join us full time. So uh, us three guys were just 
uh, pushing forward. <laughs> All right. Fabulous. Yeah. Well, you guys are doing a great job. I actually had an opportunity to meet uh, John Pounders, uh, I don't know, two, three months ago, something like that. Uh, he stopped by with Rick Hummer uh, to our house, and I got a chance to spend quite a bit of time talking with him uh, over the evening. <clears throat> and he was showing me some of the things, you know, some of the people that he had talked to and some of the unbelievably dark things that uh, you guys have come across, you know, as far as, uh, you know, satanic ritual practice and people that have been victims of it and it's like wow uh, you know it's you know i don't think people really have a clue um you know to what level or what degree you know this darkness has spread you know over the earth and and you guys are doing an amazing job of exposing it yeah i think the the depths of the depravity of mankind can be really shocking and I think that's why a lot of people look at the topic of Flat Earth, for example, as just this breath of fresh air in the conspiracy world because it's it's once again that uh, conspiracy with the silver lining compared to some of these other darker topics that we've explored and, and tried to shine a light into. And uh, that's why it's, uh, it's really interesting to get to see how uh, conspiracy theorists in general react differently to the Flat Earth topic. Because it, it's really different uh, than some of these other darker uh, topics that can really lead somebody to be sad about the state of humanity. Uh, because uh, with this other side of things, there's there's like this hope and there's this aspect of, of imagination and, and restoration that's given to people when they come into this flat earth research uh, compared to some of these really atrocious things that are absolutely happening in the underdregs of society. And yeah, that's some of the work that we definitely do. Yeah, that, that is awesome too. And I, you know, we really appreciate the stuff that you do. And, you know, I, you know, speaking of the flat earth, you know, in that context, um, you know, as being a silver lining, I mean, obviously, you know, we see that in a way also, because I mean, flat earth being the, you know, so-called granddaddy of all conspiracies, um, you know, a lot of people, I think, have to be conditioned, first of all, to be able to even accept this, this big of a conspiracy and everything that's going on behind it. Uh, you know, they really have to be able to see some of the other stuff that's going on, you know, the, the Sandy Hook stuff and the 9-11 stuff. And, you know, you look at that and as you kind of go along, you start, you know, figuring out that <laughs> it's like, no, not only have we been lied to, but we've been lied to about everything and literally everything is backwards, inside out, upside down, reversed. I mean, it's just everything is completely opposite of what it actually should be. And, of course, you know, I think a lot of people that, that are studying conspiracies, you know, when they start getting that idea, then when they finally do come to the topic of flat earth, it, it makes it a lot easier for them to accept. But, uh, you know, I've, I've kind of struggled at times, you know, philosophically with you know, being one of the people kind of out there in the forefront, you know, trying to spread this message of Flat Earth, because um, I think we all realize that the the controllers have a lot of power. And granted, that power is given to them by, you know, the consent of the governed, uh, most of which, you know, 90 percent are, are sound asleep. But they literally have so much power that, you know, they're able to start, um, you know, getting things censored. And I think that if that doesn't stop it, they're going to start taking more and more Orwellian type of, you know, measures. Uh, for example, we now know that DARPA is uh, involved in, in trying to tamp down uh, the flat earth buzz uh, as it goes on and because it's getting unbelievably uh, widespread. But do you ever wonder sometimes that, that in, in spreading this message, that we are pushing the controllers and the powers that be into a position um, where they have to do something that is not going to be good for mankind? Yeah, I think in any way censorship is not good for mankind. Whenever you can't tolerate an alternative narrative, uh, it's, it becomes a dangerous world to live in. And now there's been articles coming out recently that talked about how certain information is going to be looked at as domestic terrorism, certain conspiracies. And I think that's one of the things that I try to capture in this film is to break down what built people up to the overarching flat earth belief in such a way that 
they would have that information cataloged and preserved so that in five, ten years, when it becomes maybe illegal to have a conspiracy that that disavows the Apollo missions or, or speaks against the government, then that information will be able to be given to somebody and say, hey, this is how people could come to a flat earth belief in 2019, especially when we see the way that uh, censorship on the internet is starting to go in this trend where uh, just in the past few months, people are having a lot of issues finding the original flat earth videos, understanding why people actually can believe it. And instead, they're only able to view these videos that are uh, debunking it or making fun of it. And I think in the next few years, as we see society change to a way where the internet is tailored to specific individuals, we can see that Orwellian state come into place. And and that's where it is kind of frightening to think about what they could do if they decide anybody speaking against the government or anybody talking on these various conspiracies is now an enemy of the state. And and this is not something that we're just fantasizing about. We see this already in place in countries like China and in Russia, where anybody who has a dissenting voice against the government is shut down and they're sent off to gulags and, and prison camps and worse. And I think the they're not sig- allowed to, to participate in society, you know, talking about that Chinese social, you know, social credit score or the social media credit system or whatever they have over there. Totally agree. It's just uh, ridiculous. It gets to be quite scary that you're not even allowed. Uh, questioning your government is part of being human, being to, uh, you know, being a democracy, being, um, uh, aware of your surroundings and what's happened in the past and uh, throughout all of history. Uh, when you know a government gets too tyrannical, you need the people's right to speak out, to change the system, to make it uh, back in line with the people. If you can't do that, I, I dread to see what's going to happen 20 years from now. That's exactly right. And that's the first thing that was popping into my mind was the social credit score. What if that came to the United States, for example, where there is a massive population of flat earthers and and they started to keep people from being able to have a, a social media account if they ever spouted flat earth ideas or challenged Apollo missions. And in fact, we actually have already started to see the early stages of this in Facebook, for example. People try to make a post and, and apparently they have fact checkers which uh, ties into this whole fake news scare. And so overall, the premise of this film and the reason that I really wanted to put this piece of of work together was I saw all these media groups and social influencers covering the flat earth topic. They were jumping on this viral trend because they wanted to get the ad sense. They wanted to get the, the notoriety that was coming from something that was blowing up in such a viral way. And they weren't, they weren't really representing the Flat Earth movement in an accurate way. They were adding in their thoughts of how it's crazy, and, and they were always making fun of it. They didn't just silence themselves and listen to what was actually being presented. And so I wanted to put all of the most influential uh, arguments and a, a lot of the events that happened at these conferences as – almost a a historical archiving of why the Flat Earth Movement was possible because I didn't see anything out there uh, available that really showed the movement as it grew, explained why it grew, and and went into the details of what people actually believed and why it drew them into the overall belief. And so that was my hope for this film is that I saw the censorship coming. I saw that – Videos after videos were piling on top of anything that was pro-Flat Earth, and you couldn't actually get to the the nitty-gritty details that convinced so many people maybe three or four years ago unless you really knew how to dig. And and so that was the whole premise of the film is to present the Flat Earth topic in a digestible way to people who perhaps uh, have never looked into it, to somebody who has only seen videos – that are speaking out against it or making fun of it, and to build them up and their understanding of the movement in such a way that by the time I get to actually explaining how the Flat Earth model could work, they already have a good understanding of the underlying conspiracies that build up to Flat Earth. 
And these are so necessary and is unfortunately what I think is uh, being lost by many people because of the term flat earth. Because whenever you use the term flat earth, there's automatically that cognitive dissonance that pushes back and doesn't want to hear anything about it. But there is, in reality, many underlying conspiracies that are conspiracy facts that people have to be uh, introduced to before they're ever even ready for this even bigger overarching conspiracy. And so that's how I kind of walked people through in the journey of this film and and hope to introduce new people to the Flat Earth belief in a way that Flat Earthers right now could, could give it to their friends or family and say, hey, this will help you understand what I'm actually getting into without having to go and watch 50 hours of video online. Because uh, we see that since the cognitive dissonance uh, that the media is, is of course, buying into and, and causing everybody to just scoff and laugh at the topic, uh, people aren't even willing to waste the time to go on and, and look up videos. And, uh, and so to have something to just present in a, in a pretty uh, package with semi-comedic uh, events and, and a narrative, uh, it was a tool that I really wanted to put together and help people all around the world to understand the Flat Earth Movement. Yeah, and, and I think you did a really, really good job of it, too. Um, you know, when I watched it, I was, you know, in utter amazement. And, you know, a, a lot of people, um, you're right, They before they ever even get to this point, you know, they've got to be conditioned um, to even <laughs> come to be able to accept anything remotely like the Flat Earth. You know, like I said earlier, it's it's like if you've been in conspiracy theories for a while, um, you know, you come to the understanding that there isn't anything that they will, will not you know, try to do. I mean, everything is a lie. Uh, it's just like the the CIA director said, you know, essentially that when when everything the American public uh, believes uh, is a lie, then we've essentially, you know, completed our goal. And uh, I don't think, you know, even when it comes straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak, right, people still, you know, have a really hard time accepting anything like that. So uh, it's uh, it's kind of bizarre. And, and you know, getting back kind of to the, the social media scoring system that, that we were talking about. Um, I have to go back to a, a TV show. You know, I don't watch TV very often. And, and uh, a couple of years ago, I started watching this TV show called The Oroville, right? And The Oroville was, it, it basically had uh, Seth, uh, uh, what's his name from Family Guy? Seth, not Green, but Seth, uh, well, whatever that guy's name is. Um, he he was the captain of this starship, right? And one of the episodes that uh, was on there, they actually went to this planet where everybody had these little thumbs up or thumbs down that they had to wear on their clothing, right? And if they did anything um, that was, you know, really cool, then people could come up and press their little button and give them a thumbs up. And if they were on, you know, like worldwide media, then, you know, people could vote, you know, specifically, you know, about what they thought of it and all this stuff. And honestly, it was that show that made me stop watching because I was thinking, that's absurd. No, Nobody is ever going to go to a system like that. And now, in retrospect, you know, <laughs> we may not be wearing badges on our clothes, but wow, how close are we to that? You know, the funniest thing is that they, uh, that social credit score in China has already blocked like some, you know, 10 million people from taking domestic flights. Um, it controls what schools you can go to as far as, you know, who can rent hotels, who can use credit cards. It's crazy to think that. But on top of that, then it is said that 80% of the Chinese citizens have a positive view of the social credit system. <laughs> but when you think about that, it's like, well, of course they do. I mean, you're asking people, uh, what do you think of this system? And the second you say, well, I don't like the system, then you're not going to be able to fly or have credit cards or have a hotel. <laughs> so it's like, then they tout, oh, it's got this such a positive, uh, rating you know 80 percent of chinese citizens love it well you bet they do because they have no choice if they say they don't yeah. like it, then you're going to stop them from driving a damn car down the road yeah and, and those are with often minor topics i mean they would be even uh thrown into prison if they were to speak out against the government in different ways and it's only minor things that are getting them poured social credit scores. Just think about how uh, people would rate you if you were 
uh, speaking out against something that they've been groomed to know and love their entire lives, and you're destroying their worldview, you're going to get an F on whatever social credit score rating you're getting if, if that ever came to uh, the Western world, especially in speaking about people with a, a flat earth worldview. Uh, they would just look at you as crazy. And, and if, you're, if your ideals are so uh, out there and so contrary to what I understand reality to be, then you, you're almost dangerous. I don't want you around my kids. I don't want you talking to me on the bus. And I think, you know, that's, we don't know how soon that would come to the Western world, but we do have the examples of, of China and, and we can see how, what it's doing to their society. And, and, and it really is uh, in the echoes of that Orwellian society that we see in 1984. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it absolutely is. And, you know, you have to wonder, you know, they've, they've kind of already got it, you know, somewhat implemented, you know, with Facebook. And, uh, you know, you thumbs up, of course, you've got the thumbs up and thumbs down rating system in YouTube, although that's, you know, far from perfected because, you know, trolls can come in and, you know, hit uh, thumbs up and thumbs down. And by the way, guys, just just to mention, you know, I, I get a lot of comments about uh, how we have got our ratings. Uh, I've got the ratings uh, disabled, the thumbs up and thumbs down, like counts disabled on Globebusters. And I do that for a reason. Um, first of all, because it, it doesn't stop it from actually registering. But one of the things that the, the trolls very much like to do is they'll come back with 100 sock accounts and hit the thumbs down. And now, as pathetic as that is, we all know it's true. And so, by simply disabling that feature, um, I kind of take that. I kind of take away their little one sick pleasure that that uh, they have to be able to do that. But okay, so getting back to the point, um, you know, that system is already kind of in place. But do you think that it would ever be possible that, that we could get to a situation like that, you know, like that was being portrayed in the Orville show, where, you know, pretty much our laws uh, would be sold as, well, you know, this is a true democracy, and, you know, what everybody thinks about this is, is going to become, you know, pretty much the law. Because essentially what had happened in this, this episode was uh, they had... Uh, they had people that, you know, when they got way too many thumbs down, they would literally imprison them or in some cases put them to death, right? So uh, I, I can only see that a system like this, you know, would be sold to us, you know, under the guise of, well, this is, this is a true democracy because then, then, you know, it's truly in the hands of people, you know, what's going to be going on. But, of course, the part they wouldn't cover about that is the widespread media coverage uh, that would influence those decisions, you know, one way or the other. So uh, what do you think? How do you think that might be implemented if we actually wound up going to that? Yeah, well, I think it's already here in some form and fashion. Uh, it's not maybe in the general populace where we can just up and down vote people other than on our Facebook page or other Instagram or whatever, but definitely in the realms of the upper echelon of the academic world, right? We have... Uh, a a a strange scientific dogma that keeps different research from coming out, such as somebody that would say they found living tissue in a in a dinosaur bone and challenging the concept of carbon dating that mainstream scientists would have to bury because it would challenge their funding. It would challenge uh, the different research that they've put out and and so they squash that dissenting voice that other narrative that could explain the things that we observe and contest scientifically. And we absolutely see that in these upper levels of the academic world is anybody who challenges the status quo has to be squashed. And it, it takes years of fighting back against the system to get new scientific theories introduced into the whole world. And, and I think that's maybe something that uh, it just trickles down because at the academic level, you know, you have to be really brave and well-funded to be able to fight back against the system for a lot of reasons, uh, because there's just this an enormous amount of pressure to give in to the already presented theories, and and I think that just trickles down into society as people say, well, th those guys in lab coats say this is an absolute fact, and they don't realize that there is room for debate and contention at those high levels of academia when it comes to observations of reality. 
and and I think that that's just how it is happening in today's world that we're seeing the general populace who who are not physicists or astrophysicists or or any any of those doctorate level degrees uh, saying that they absolutely know aspects of reality that they really are having to depend on photographs and imagery and the word of these men who are just doing equations on chalkboards and and it's that trickle down effect I think that causes that mob mentality that's so dangerous because at the higher levels, of course, you can have a doctorate arguing against a doctorate. But once the, the one person's convinced the masses of their scientific theory, then the people grab tor- pi- <laughs> torches and pitchforks and chase anybody that would disagree with their high ranking high priest of Scientology or whatever and <laughs> or scientism. And and I think that's what we can kind of see. And I think it's dangerous, like in areas like China, uh, one last time on the social credit score, whenever the state steps in and starts dictating who and what you should believe. And I think that's where we're we're in a more of a free state here in the Western world. We, we don't have to believe exactly what the state says, but uh, I could definitely see that in the future. Well, I think we're really close, especially with, uh, you know, educational curriculums that come out and... Uh, obviously you have to push evolution if you're a teacher in school. And I've been talking about this a lot lately and, you know, thanks for bringing up the, the, you know, soft tissue and dinosaur bones. Cause I think that that's so huge that people recognize that there are other guys in lab, white lab coats that are saying other things and are finding other things in their research when they do, and they bring it to the forefront, they get fired, they get let go. So what that does is anybody else who's behind them, who's also doing the same kind of work. Uh, therefore can no longer bring that stuff to the forefront, can no longer come out and say, oh, I also found soft tissue in this dinosaur bone uh, that I found, or whatever else the the research might bring, uh, you're being socially, uh, or at least in your profession, um, looked down upon and possibly losing your job. And when people have put in years of education, years of research, uh, you're supporting a family, uh, you know, you've got a mortgage, you've got car payments, you've got credit card bills, uh, unfortunately, it's, you're put in a position where you don't have the resources to come out and just say, hey, I disagree with the mainstream because you know you're going to be attacked. You know, it's kind of like this Mark Armitage and these other guys. Uh, like you said, if you don't have funding, if you don't have, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars in the bank to back you up if you lose your job, uh, they've essentially blocked you from bringing any of this information to the public. Yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And that's, uh, you know, that's a huge deterrent, especially if you happen to work for a company uh, that is uh, their primary source of income is uh, government contracts, right? So, (laughs) you know, I mean, and here we are, and here's the government that's influencing this with our tax dollars, you know, according to their agenda or the lobbyists' agenda. And, And we know ultimately you know, the lobbyists, you know, although they do have some degree of influence and, and even a large degree of influence in a lot of cases, um, really the ultimate agenda is is the what the elites want. Uh, and a good example of that, I think, is Google and YouTube. Um, so many people, so many content providers are up in arms uh, and they are taking heavy criticism you know, for their blatant censorship of so many things, right? And it, to the degree that it's even going to cost them money, you know, uh, for banning streams like, you know, Owen Benjamin's who, uh, you know, I don't know if many people know this or not, but when a super chat is received, one third of that super chat goes directly to Google, right? So you have channels like that that are generating hundreds if not thousands of dollars in super chats um, that are being uh, completely censored you know, demonetize, whatever. And it doesn't matter because to them, the goal, the overall goal of, of, of keeping the propagation of the globe lie is more important than the money because really the money has never been the objective. It's never been the reason for any of this. Um, you know, we talked a long time ago about how the governments or the private institutions that are in league with the governments are printing all the money and they can print all they want and they do. And, you know, so that factor is, is completely irrelevant. It is about the control and the steering of, uh, the, the, the general populace's, you know, state of mind and their way of thinking. So, 
yeah, it, it really is kind of sad that that it has been masterfully done. You know, the way that they have manipulated this all into you know one particular area, and again, this all you know goes right back, Jake. You know, to a lot of the stuff that that you cover uh, into the Illuminati, the elite, the very dark satanic agendas, uh, etc. Yeah, I think that's what's so great about the flat earth topic is it really is this overall conspiracy that can undermine these underlying dark and seedy ones. And, and it gives people this drive to step out in activism. And that's something that I got to cover in the film is people going out there and speaking to others on the streets and covering, uh, the, the just change of people's faces as they, as they, realized that they couldn't explain where they lived as well as they thought. And, and to see how they react was just a fantastic uh, way to present the, the flat earth activism and, and the reason the movement's growing as a whole. And one of the, the great examples that I got to capture was this guy who was standing on the street and he was uh, just standing in line getting ready to get on a boat and I had a, I was recording uh, this uh, flat earth activist named Rome Walker and he went up to him and started to tell him, look, man, you matter. And he started to try to explain flat earth concepts to this guy. And, and the, this gentleman goes, I suck. You suck. We're nothing. I'm worthless. You're worthless. And it really shows the mentality that this modern, secular, hedonistic worldview uh, brings on to people. And what he was doing after the fact I realized was directly quoting Bill Nye the Science Guy, who, by the way, doesn't have very many scientific degrees at all. He's just an actor. But these people have been duped into believing they – are being scientific and they're trusting in a system that is scientific and, and empirical, but really they're putting faith in this system of, of theories and beliefs that really trusts on man-made opinions more than actual observations. But I think it's really the space programs and the things that they have put out that have kind of backed up what these other scientists propose and talk about, and, and to the point where people have to come to irrational conclusions because they're trusting in uh, just a picture. And they're saying, well, I, I might not be able to observe something or test something for myself, so I'm going to put all my trust in what I'm being shown. And for people to grasp that concept and be able to be introduced to it in a, a, a way that's not obtrusive, that doesn't turn them defensive, is is a real uh, finessey thing, and of course, <laughs> yeah, and of course, you, how do you tell ahead. somebody that you know with planets? Uh, as much as you've been told about planets, think of all the pictures you've seen and everything you've been sold, and yet nobody has had any influence on their life of a planet. You know, I mean, as far as like what they tell us, you know, it has no impact on you uh, if you're talking about oh Mars is this planet or Jupiter. It's just storytelling. It's just, it has nothing yeah. to do with experience. It just transcends that and goes into a place that is illusion. Um, I think what you were saying there, too, was really interesting about uh, the street activism. When you have the guy in the, in the documentary that's saying we're all worthless, we're all nothing. It's like, what kind of person does that create? How do people not see right in front of their eyes? Uh, what kind of morality is that person going to have? You know, if he sees 10 or 20 bucks on a counter somewhere, is he just going to grab it? Because why? Because we're all, we're all gross. We're all disgusting. We're all just inconsequential. It doesn't matter what you do here. I think it creates a, a terrible person. And I don't know how people don't see that when you've got one belief, this belief that we're all inconsequential, that we all came from nothing, that we're all going to dirt when we die. Uh, I think it makes a terrible world, whether people see that or not. And, you know, of course they try and teach it as it's very scientific. It's very uh, intellectual belief. Uh, but really, what kind of person are we creating here? Yeah, and I think it ties back into that term. It creates a a hedonistic mindset where if people don't believe there's any point to life, then what's the point of life? Well, to seek after p pleasure, to seek after what feels the best. And how can you feel the best? Well, what the system tells you is to become part of the system, to work their jobs, to uh, do what they want you to do, to pay into their model of reality so that you can benefit from it. And I think that's what really people are being prepped for with this worthless mentality of, you know, I'm just a, a speck of dust, so while I'm here, I might as well live it up, right? 
Well, things change when you realize that there's a significance to a life that you might not have fathomed when you were coming from an atheistic perspective, whenever you were coming uh, at reality in, in such a way that you were just a, a pointless speck of dust on a, on a rock that is hurling through space at bi- millions of miles an hour, and you could just snuff out. So what's the point other than chasing out your own pleasures? And I think that's kind of what it builds people up to and causes people to settle into this slave mentality of I need to serve the system because the system feeds me. Right. Yeah. 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 Got people who, who, you know, like I think it was said in the movie somewhere, I don't remember where, but when uh, maybe it was Rob Skiba who says, you know, it's hard to trust these scientists who don't believe in God. I mean, it's just a big thing for me. You know, when these guys have a worldview uh, that is completely different than I think reality is, well, when they've got all their data and they try and force it, out some end that, you know, make sure that there is no God, that make sure that they are the smartest beings that have ever been here, uh, then I just, I turn it off. And I think a lot of people do, and more people need to do it. It's just, it's just scary for that. But I think um, another thing I wanted to mention that I think you did a great job on in the movie was making it a question as far as what if the earth was flat? You know, I, I think that's, uh, maybe, maybe people don't recognize that that's brilliant. You know, I try and do, you know, I've done a couple movies, you know, are we spinning? I think asking the question sometimes is more opening to the yeah, viewer yeah. than simply putting something in their face. The earth is flat. Uh, you've been lied to. Uh, sometimes it's easier to ask, what if you've been lied to? Uh, what would it look like if you being, are being deceived? And sometimes people are a little bit more open to that. So first thing I saw when I saw the title of your um, documentary is I said, this is great. This is what a lot of people should be doing. And you know, it's just a suggestion to people out there. Of course, do whatever you want, make whatever you want. But sometimes when you ask that question, I think it's much more appealing to people to tune in and just ask themselves, you know, what if? You know, I think that's a great way to start it. So that was great in my opinion. Exactly. And and that's the whole reason I voiced it in that way. Now, of course, whenever I started off really recording the conferences, I, I was on the fence in a lot of ways myself. I just wanted to play the devil's advocate and juggle the differing questions and opinions But whenever I realized that the Flat Earth Conspiracy is more of debunking what the world is and how it's presented rather than presenting this is absolutely what it is uh, in an alternative fashion, then it drew me in because, of of course, I had the conspiracy mindset. I realized that there is conspiracy fact out there. And if I could introduce this topic to people uh, that – also see conspiracy fact in other areas, then perhaps they'd be willing to consider this really hard to swallow pill. And and I think whenever you look at uh, the way you draw somebody into the question, you have to have the conversation because the moment you start making statements, they already have defensive mechanisms that they've been taught to engage. And whenever you have the question, it engages them. It causes them to respond and to have to give a statement themselves. And of course, a lot of people, they, they don't know for sure. They, they're willing to just quote something they've heard or regurgitate something they've learned. But whenever you can have that conversation, you realize that people don't have as strong of a foundation of belief as they might have duped themselves into thinking. And so that, that I think that's really why I, I narrated it in, a, in the form of a journey. I was going to all these conferences. I was just getting into the mind of a flat earther. And I'm not going to be like all this other media out there, all these uh, channels and social influencers that basically start off saying, well, we know that flat earth is crazy, but now I'll talk about the theory. Instead, I was just going to go – well, this is exactly why they believe it, and I'm not going to argue. I'm just going to show you what is being presented, what's being talked about, so that I'm not tainting the viewpoint that you come to at the end of the question. And I think that's what's so convincing uh, for a lot of people who are good at at introducing the flat earth topic is they can well, start to – is. That's what reporting should be. Exactly, yes. Where did we ever get away from that to where everything is spun into a narrative before you even get – the reporting out. So I applaud you for that because you're absolutely right. That uh, I saw it happen to me numerous times, and that's why I've kind of uh, turned off a lot of these uh, requests from media outlets uh, because I said, no, I've already seen what you've done with the flat Earth. Is that you ask us like you're interested, you approach us as if you're interested, uh, you let us talk to you as if you're interested, even face to face. You're right there acting as if you understand. You're getting the point. 
And then the second that we turn our backs and you're ready to put out something, you just go and spin the narrative in your way, take clips of what we say, take video of what we say, and spin it and put it out in your changed fashion. And so immediately you're like, well, what the hell? If this is their their method for getting flat earth out, which is to completely misrepresent what we say, misrepresent what we do, misrepresent what we believe, uh, putting pictures of the flying disc in space and saying this is what these guys believe, or going to the Flat Earth Society and saying that we think that the disc is flying upwards. Immediately, you just have to say, there's a problem here. So I applaud you for at least not going in that direction and at least coming from it from an honest standpoint and honest um, viewpoint. Yes. Yeah, very now, much. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, you did a really great job in that. And and again, I agree with Jaron in that uh, when you when you come right out and you you know, make the statement, well, the earth is flat or something like that. I mean, that we already know the, the stigma that creates, right, the reaction. Um, it's violent in some cases. It's absolutely unbelievable. And how they managed to build that into our social programming was obviously another stroke of genius. And so, you know, I, I agree. The best way to kind of circumvent that is to come at it, you know, from a standpoint of asking questions of, you know, well, what if this isn't exactly true? Or what if it's maybe a different way or uh, other than being assertive on the point? Um, I, I just think that there's a, a better way to do it. And I agree with Jaren 100% on that. So sorry about that. Go ahead, Jake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, another perspective I came at it was, of course, personally, my faith-based background and, and the work that we do on NICE TV, we, we try to tie things back to a, a biblical viewpoint. And something that's interesting to me is that there's many uh, people of religious faith all around the world, Christians, you name it, that have strong fundamental beliefs that are in direct opposition opposition to what science proposes. And and they have no problem believing what the, the scriptures talk about or, or what the Bible talks about. And and so that's what was something that was uh, presented in the film that I tried to explain in detail is, hey, if some of your beliefs are in direct opposition to mainstream science, and yet you have also great scientifically minded doctorate level people that are are validating these ancient texts, such as uh, men who have done work showing that in the uh, rock layers there is evidence for a worldwide flood, and and coming at the mainstream narrative that is trying to interpret these rock layers as, as millions and millions of years and and debunking that in a very scientific and rational and empirical way, they are then validating their beliefs and their faith. And so what's interesting to me is that in a lot of ways, why are they stopping short when it comes to the flat earth topic? Why are they willing to buy into the cosmology that these scientists push, but they're also at the same time challenging them when it comes to evolution or the carbon dating methods or or the the age of the earth or or any of these other underlying aspects that that contradict their beliefs? Uh, they're kind of giving a pass in these other areas that can be uh, looked at in an empirical, scientific way, but with a different viewpoint. And and that's something I tried to address in the film is, hey, the censorship that's coming to Flat Earth and Flat Earth people and content should be a red flag for anybody out there with a viewpoint or a faith that contradicts mainstream science in some form or fashion. Because if the the, sci the the flat earth topic becomes censored and becomes dangerous and becomes just crazy to talk about, how long until your own closely held beliefs are also challenged? Yeah, isn't that the truth? So, yeah, and, and you're right. The way that, that the, the methods that they use to validate um, their own, you know, crazy assumptions, methodologies, and are ridiculous because you know it's just like math you know they'll sit there and and uh, validate their findings with a mathematical formula that is based entirely on assumption after assumption after assumption and you know that's that's no way to to validate anything you know <laughs> it's 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 just preposterous but yet that's how they do it and people for some reason blindly accept that and it goes into many other areas um, you know in, in which they use that methodology so uh, pretty crazy stuff, Jake. It, it really is. So, yeah. 
Oh, go ahead, Jaron. No, I wasn't going to say anything. I, I mean, I do have a question as to, well, not a question, but just, a, you know, a point that you, it's impressive to me that you basically put this documentary together over, what, three years, right? Or two. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it was since the first international conference that I really started gathering the the footage and the interviews that I used in the overall film. So uh, I this is one of the few pieces that that is current up until now, at least until this uh, next conference in November, uh, that has really followed the growth of the Flat Earth movement uh, from the very first big international conference and explaining the instrumental experiments and events that has led uh, many of the people that even speak at the conferences into a flat earth uh, mindset. And so I kind of followed starting at the first international conference and from there, I went to every uh, conference that was held in North America and also to several meetups, experiments, and and of course, just some really uh, interesting footage that shows the behind the scenes of the Flat Earth movement that that gives humanity to the movement as a whole that, that really is not uh, found in a lot of these other media pieces because – uh, for for example, in the film, I have this really interesting segment where I introduce several of the speakers at the uh, Canadian conference. Jaron, you were on. Jaron and Bob, you were on the stage there, right. and and during that segment, uh, these alarms start going off, and <laughs> and I tried to explain this feeling of being locked in a room full of conspiracy theorists who think they're under an emergency <laughs> threat, and it's just this hilarious event, uh, and of course coming from the American uh, propaganda of, of sh live shooter events and stuff, it was a really tense moment. And and during this tense moment of all the speakers looking around, I tried to capture each one's uh, unique expressions of I'm putting my life on the line by being on this stage and trying to share this this information with all these people. And and that's what I tried to do with the film is is to try to humana uh, show the humanity and show the the level at which people are putting their their names on the line when it comes to the flat earth topic and and that's really uh you know, the journey that i went on and then of course the next one being the the next big flat earth international conference in 2018 uh covering how that was just this this uh this moment where a lot of celebrity attention came to it some positive some very negative and and how this propelled the movement to grow and how the conferences in a lot of ways uh, and the movement grew in a similar fashion to the Marvel's thematic universe uh, <laughs> in such a form and fashion that uh, I compared, for example, Robbie Davidson, who is putting on the international conferences. I compared him to Captain America, who called the Avengers to assemble. And while no one superhero uh, is – outdoes the others or or is the leader or or anything like that uh you see that more and more content producers banded together and started to present this information to the mainstream and and that's uh so fascinating to see how uh it was these conferences that really introduced the flat earth topic to mass media as a whole and and to see their interactions and their reactions is another thing i captured in the film as I explained and showed, hey, uh, this is what you might have seen on the evening television, but can you also understand why it would have drawn somebody to research the Flat Earth topic further? Uh, and so I have a, a short segment in there that goes through some of the most popular uh, TV shows and late night reality stars and and different celebrities that started speaking out on Flat Earth. And, and I think it's so fascinating to see how the movement is growing and spreading uh, to some of these people with quite a bit of notoriety. Uh, now the hope would be hopefully somebody with you know millions of dollars to drop on funding actual <laughs> empirical evidence will come along one day soon. Uh, but I, I can definitely see that uh, that's some of the reasons that the, the movement grew was because – the, it was a viral trend, and we are in a, a a meme culture where if somebody sees something that's odd or or out of the norm, they want to throw their two cents on it. They want to alter it a little bit so that they can use it to propel whatever they're doing. But they didn't realize that 
whenever they mischaracterize what was being presented at these conferences, people go and they realize that pretty quickly it was a straw man argument. And when they do deeper research, they go, oh my goodness, I can totally see what they're talking about. And and I think that's so what was so fascinating to me that that's kind of how I got uh, hooked in at the first conference was – I was like, well, hold on a second. I agree with everything that they're talking about. There are issues with the photography. There are uh, issues with the math that we've been given, and we shouldn't be able to see this far. There are uh, breakdowns of the video and, and the photography presented from the ISS that really does make you go, wait a second. We have absolutely been lied to. And so if somebody has lied to me at some point, at any point, I'm not willing to trust them in the future. I might listen to what they have to say. I might be nice to them, but why do I have to believe what they're presenting? You don't. And, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. And, no, that's how I treat you know NASA. Is, you know, once you've uh, caught them in one lie and two lies, then then it's easy to just dismiss what they put out. I still watch it. I still look into it. I still explore it. Still discuss it. But I no longer uh, believe it. But uh, yeah, it was great that you put that whole. Uh, alarm situation in Canada. I had completely forgot about that. You know, <laughs> just and to see that again. It was like, and and nobody. I didn't know anybody was filming all that. You know, really. I thought that uh, you know, besides what was on the live stream, and I'd seen that before. But that was just really well done. Um, there were some other things in there that were great too. Rick Hummer with the thunder and lightning incident. Uh, just there, those are things that I've forgotten that have happened along this way that were uh, simply incredible. So uh, sorry to interrupt there, but yeah, I totally see what you're saying and. Agree. Yeah. I mean, they were the little nuances that would be lost along the way as this surmounting amount of bad video coverage of these the flat earth topic starts to pile on top of the information that really is intriguing, that really does have some substance to it. And I think that's what I was trying to do with this film is uh, with uh, to tie back one, one more time to the topic of how the Internet is changing. I believe in the past 10, 15 years, we have been in this golden age of the internet where information has been able to pass porously between different people. People have been allowed to have this controversial conversation, to talk about conspiracies, to to propagate it. And and I, I fear that that golden age of the internet is quickly coming to an end. And and soon, nobody's going to be able to find the videos and the photography that we've used to completely shine a light on the deception that's coming from these agencies. And they're going to look back and be like, these people absolutely were crazy. They, they had no substance to their argument because, look, I mean, these, these videos are flawless. And we're coming to a state of technology and, and, and FX and, and graphic design that – we will not be able to pull apart and debunk the stuff that's coming down the chute in the very near future. And <laughs> and that's something I really wanted to try to help people understand and why I had the film uh, kind of present all of the major uh, videos and, and images that have been debunked over the past few years because – Whenever they start to propagandize, especially since the last 50th anniversary that was a few months ago, uh, these new space missions and the the uh, the SpaceX uh, shuttle programs and the new moon landings that they're going to try to be doing, the stuff that they show us is going to be indecipherable from reality. It it will be completely convincing. And it will only be this generation of people that have lived in the golden age of conspiracy that are standing in the back of the room saying, I don't buy it. I don't believe what they're saying because I know they lied to me in the past. And and I think that's the significance of, of making a film like this because whenever it becomes so indoctrinated into the population – where they're constantly being shown new space missions and new moon landings and new this and that. And, and it is uh, undecipherable from reality. Then what, what are people like uh, you and Bob uh, going to be doing? Well, you're going to be crossing your arms in the back of the room, still talking about what you're talking about today. Uh, albeit 
you know, with a little bit less uh, ability to uh, show and point it out to people, but that's the danger. And so I think uh, to help people understand why the Flat Earth Movement has grown, why people are able to debunk the photos and videos that have been given to us over the past, you know, 50 years, then it helps preserve this mindset of skepticism when it will be very necessary in the coming future. Yeah. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more with that, Jake. And getting back to a, a point that you raised earlier, it's like, you know, the internet is becoming a, an archive of, of, of humanity's activities, um, everything about us. I mean, you can pull up virtually anything um, on the internet, going back to traffic cams, going back months, years, uh, any, any type of data. I mean, virtually anything that's ever been put out there uh, is ultimately archived on the internet. But what we are seeing today without a doubt, is the elimination of those data sets, those, those datum that are uh, in opposition to the mainstream narrative. And this is why I think it's really important, especially as, as, as storage is becoming very, very cheap, right? Um, the people that are researching this um, do not rely on YouTube or Google or the internet to have it archived somewhere because we know full well that it's being eliminated to the point where nobody's going to be able to find it. You know, take it upon yourself to archive this information. Take it upon yourself to, uh, you know, have a local copy of, of very incriminating things that, that have gone on with NASA and the government. Because, you know, as Jake said, eventually, you know, their narrative is going to override it and we're not going to have any resource material to, to pull from, right? Unless, unless we have this, you know, archived, and then we can go back and say, isn't this interesting? Um, the government has buried this. If you look anywhere for this particular clip or whatever, this, this uh, bit of information, you know, that, I'm, that I would be showing or whatever, and you can't find it anywhere. What does that tell you about a, a society that archives everything uh, except, of course, anything that is contrary to the mainstream view, right? Yes. Yeah, and and I think that's uh, the significance of saving things offline, uh, preparing for the age of AI computers that can crunch the numbers in such a minute way that your browsing habits will be tailored specifically for you, uh, to the point maybe that they will start showing you things uh, to veer you in a certain ideological pattern. We see this with Project Veritas that was reporting on the 2016 election, for example. And they talked about how social media and and tailored posts for certain demographics really influenced the election in major ways. And they were reporting the, the uh, coming election in 2020 in the United States would be even more so uh, tainted by social media and different platforms pushing specific viewpoints that they want their audience to either vote towards or, or whatever. And I think that's – we're just in the beginning stages of this crazy age of the internet where they have the power, uh, computing power, to really make uh, a person's worldview change. Because we spend a majority of our time online. Most people in the Western world are glued to their phones. Most people are scrolling. And, and we don't take into account how much we are being convinced uh, and being swayed in different positions by the, the amount of memes that we see that are talking about a certain viewpoint or the amount of friends on our 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 friends list that we see their posts and they're all seeming to lean to one tent or, or another. And so that makes me want to lean over on that side as well. And so how, how do we know that they're not going to start doing that with even just viewpoints of reality? How do we know they're not going to start tailoring it so that if you've ever in the past looked up a, a flat earth video, they're going to constantly bombard you with information that tries to debunk it or tries to sway your viewpoint. And in fact, this is already the case and is something I covered in the film, uh, which was a, a conspiracy of my own discovery. And I'm, of course, you guys have most likely uh, experienced it. But whenever searching uh, flat earth YouTube channels, whenever you would click on them over the past few months, the first advertisement that would pop up is a masterclass 
by astronaut Chris Hatfield. <laughs> yep. And you guys are probably very aware of this because it was actually one of your videos that I used to demonstrate this in the film. And it was just so frustrating to see the effort that was being put into promoting and propagandizing the, the NASA missions. Because I feel the more that they shout, yes, we went, the less people will be able to say, I don't buy it. And, and that's, that's really what I'm seeing, especially since this 50th anniversary. And, uh, I find it very interesting and I had to, uh, backtrack in the, the film and, and, and report it because I wanted to be as accurate as possible to what was coming out concurrently was that I know we've, we've had the NASA footage from the, the Apollo 11 missions for many years and it was all very grainy and it was trashy and they would always talk about how they didn't have the tapes and they lost it. Well, I find it very interesting that just around the time of the 50th anniversary, some guy just so happens to release a slightly clearer version. And and I cover this in the film to show, look, they are trying to backtrack and undo the damage that they themselves have caused by <laughs> only making, what, one Hollywood movie uh, before, of course, the uh, the the recent Apollo 11 movie movie that came out and and I know uh, Brad Pitt's coming out with his own astronaut movie and all this but movies ba based on what they would depict as reality uh, there was very few astronaut movies especially when you look at how Hollywood always covers all these different documentary topics and they love to put their their cinematic twist on it but they really gave a long leash to skeptics for many many years and then the 50th anniversary hits right around the time that the Flat Earth Movement is blowing up in their face and they're going, uh-oh, <laughs> we need to start putting stuff out there at a, 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 a an immense rate to combat this narrative that is debunking us. And I think they're starting to grab their wallets going, hold on a second, we like our $58 million a day budget, we want to keep it. And so if if they start saying that all we're doing is – is putting out fake imagery and, and fake videos, then perhaps we'll be at risk. And I don't think it'll ever come to a point where they're, they're completely exposed because I think there's so much of our society that is tied to these agencies uh, that the entire society would have to crumble if this, the agencies themselves did. Right, yeah. If the, if, if the American space program ever crumbled, America itself would have to crumble with it because there's so much pride uh, in that, I just can't picture people just accepting tomorrow. Oh, I guess it was all a lie. Uh, once they accept that, they're going to see that there's obviously much deeper lies <laughs> everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, in in relation to what you were just saying, Jake, um, it made me think of this particular article um, that came out in April of 2018 from Forbes um, that stated only two thirds of American millennials believe the Earth is round. And it's it's interesting. <laughs> They go through all these statistics, and this isn't the only study, by the way, that, that showed this, um, but they go into, you know, all these different uh, polls and studies that have been done and, uh, you know, break it down into, uh, you know, age groups and, and whatnot. But it is alarming, uh, obviously, to them about how many people are in, you know, great doubt about um, the shape of the earth, you know, whether or not it's flat or concave or convex or whatever. Um, so many people uh, are, you know, just simply not believing the mainstream narrative anymore. And, and you couple that with the unbelievable amount of people worldwide that just know, absolutely know straight up that the Apollo missions were fake and are looking further into NASA's, you know, chicanery, essentially, uh, with the shuttle program. And, and, you know, now it's gone on to Elon Musk. They're trying to put a different spin on it. Uh, trying to make people think, well, uh, now we have private enterprise in doing, you know, doing this, so it's not the government lying to us anymore. Of course, what they're negating to to mention is that, you know, Elon is heavily government subsidized, and uh, you know the government has full access to all of these projects. But you know, this kind of stuff right here, when it comes out in Forbes magazine, um, that's a problem for them uh, it, because then all of a sudden it gets very, very real, right? Yeah, ab absolutely. I, I think whenever they see the statistics of the growth of the Flat Earth movement, there's a desperation to stop this and to cut 
the cut the head off the snake before it grows any bigger, I guess. And and I think whenever they look at um, the the types of people that are starting to speak out about the errors in the photography and the errors in the video, that's what really makes them nervous. Because I know uh, just recently there's a lot of celebrities and people with a lot of social clout that are starting to speak out and and say just research it just look it up it's really interesting and and that's i think what's so fascinating because it's almost like their effort to curb the flat earth uh, movement uh, worked to their disadvantage because all of the information that they're putting out now and all of the censorship that's coming is really uh turning the the movement into a type of martyr uh, to cause people to go, hold on a second. Why is why am I getting bombarded with an astronaut uh, <laughs> commercial every five stinking minutes, you know? And and it causes them to kind of push back. Yeah. And and with yeah, and go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say you're absolutely right. And you know, it's funny because one of the, the criticisms that, that flat earthers get, you know, and conspiracy gener- uh, theorists in general, is they will say, well, this is obviously a failure of the educational system. And to that, I say, amen, brother. That's exactly what it is. It is a failure of the educational system in the indoctrination of the people. That's where the failure has come, um, because people are seeing beyond that illusion. And, uh, uh, you know, and that is ultimately, you know, the agenda of the so-called education system. It has nothing to do really with educating people. It has everything to do with, you know, memorization and regurgitation, which is nothing more than indoctrination. It is not about teaching uh, critical thinking. It is about uh, teaching what needs to be done to pass the test, get the grade, get your degree, or you fail, and that's it. You know, that's what it's really about. So, yeah, it is a failure of the education system. And thank God for that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and I know uh, people are seeing on the screen there uh, different scenes from the film as, as it playing out. But uh, the way that I built up the overall narrative, uh, I start first with the movement, the conferences. Hey, this is happening. And then I go into the varying uh, conspiracies <laughs> Uh, as it leads up uh, to, okay, if I don't believe in the worldview that I've been presented anymore, if I don't believe in the images that I've been shown, then what's the alternative? And that's when the door is then open to say, here are some different empirical observations that you can you know, ex- explore yourself, and this is how the world could work if it's not what we have been shown. Yeah. There, yeah, very definitely. And that and that's a good way to approach it. Um, so, you know, I, I, I really, really think you did a masterful job on this, Jake. And, um, you know, like I said, it's a long it's a long documentary. It's about uh, three hours long, I think. Right. Um, oh, yeah. But, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it took it took a it took a lot of cutting uh, painful cuts. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it ended up being a, over three hours the first edit. And of course, nobody wants to sit around for that long, even if it is a controversial topic like this. But uh, of course, uh, we have available also on the nystv.org site, uh, I'm releasing full uh, uncut interviews and different scenes and stuff that I wasn't able to fit into the film. So if the film is interesting to you and you enjoyed it, uh, then you can, of course, find other full uncut interviews uh, with some other really interesting behind-the-scenes discussions and and uh, and footage that's going to be there on the site. Yep, beautiful. Yeah, um, and okay, well, super. Uh, you know, I, I got to tell you, it's and it's about it's two hours and 45 minutes, so, I mean, that's very, very doable. A lot of movies these days are... You know, somewhere between the uh, two and three hour mark. And the beauty of this is, of course, you can always put it on pause and take as long of an intermission as you want uh, in watching it. But, you know, I found myself uh, very much riveted by it. And, uh, you know, it, because you kept it flowing, you, you had a beautiful flow to it. Your, your commentary, your narration of it is, is beautiful. Um, it, it is really interesting, very engaging. And uh, everything about it was just absolutely fabulous. So, and of course, the good news about it is that anybody can watch this documentary for free. So, you want to tell us about that, Jake? 
Yes, absolutely. You know, with this topic, I think uh, a lot of people can get free access to many videos online. And so we wanted to make it available to anybody to watch for free uh, so that they can share it out. Um, we have it on our membership network, nystv.org. And you have to sign up for a membership. And this is just the same thing that Netflix has people do is you can get a free month to try it out and watch anything on our website. Um, and the way you do that is whenever you sign up for a membership, type in the promo code, all under caps, one word, flat earth, whenever you click uh, to sign up and create a membership. And so whenever you sign up, it, it makes the charge zero dollars. And at any time you can cancel your account and you can watch the film and our other content for free for a month. And, uh, and of course, if you want to support our work, you can stick around on the website. We appreciate that, of course. Uh, that way you can get access to anything we put out there on the future in, f in the future. And, uh, and so, yeah, that's how you guys get access to it with, uh, on nystv.org type in the promo code, uh, flat earth and, uh, it's uh, one month free. All right. Beautiful. See, can't beat that deal at all. That's awesome. And, uh, you know, like I said, this is so well worth it people. I mean, this is, uh, you know, just honestly, it's, uh, probably the best documentary I think I've ever seen on, on flat earth. Uh, even though I got to tell you, Ben's recent one was, it's not a documentary, but it was pretty close. It, <laughs> we have, we have some really amazing talent in the flat earth community. There's no doubt about it. And uh, it's, it's really hard to rank what is the best, but I got to tell you, this is right up there at the top and uh, you did a beautiful job on it for sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and what, one thing, if I could add is for those of you who do get the opportunity to watch it, uh, especially flat earthers there that might want to help uh, help the movement and help get this in front of other people, uh, please go to the IMDB page and give it a good rating, a good uh, review. Uh, we're trying to beat the analytics, make this uh, flat earth film uh, really pop on the IMDB page, and that'll help us out a lot. So if you have the opportunity to watch the film, please give us a good rating and a review on that site. That'll really help uh, promote the film and get it out there in front of uh, more of the mainstream community. Yeah, that's awesome. And Jake, if you would be so kind uh, at some point uh, after the show or during the show as to leave a link to where people can do that, I will put it in the show notes so that they can have a, a real quick, they don't have to go searching for it. They can just click right into it. All right. I will do. All right. Beautiful. All right. So, um, you know, I, Jaren and I both think very highly, I have to tell you, um, you know, the other people that I know that have seen it, uh, Ben thought extremely highly of it. Uh, uh, Alex, uh, flat earth man, <laughs> uh, conspiracy music guru, uh, watched it also. He said it was, uh, absolutely just knocked it out of the ballpark. Absolutely loved it. So everybody, um, that uh, I know of that has watched it has absolutely raved over it. And, and I have to, I got to tell you, you know, I'm right there with them. It's, it's really, really good. So excellent. So, uh, we need the Spanish version people. Oh, Hey, you're oh, right. yeah. I didn't even know you were here. <laughs> Hello everyone. I was, I was quiet. Uh, I been here like 50 minutes ago, but, um, I just been quiet listening and congratulations shake for the documentary. Yes, thank you. Yeah, and, and I, of course, we're open to uh, anybody that would want to help uh, get a, a Spanish uh, translated narration over that. That would be great to reach uh, the the other language speaking peoples of the world. Yeah, that would well, be awesome. Yeah. I was say, I'm sure Iru could probably find somebody to do that, right, Iru? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I want to, I, I, I'm going to watch first because I, I didn't know it. Uh, about this documentary, so and then I'm going to try to share with the community in the Spanish, the Spanish community, and maybe someone. Th there are people out there that always help me to translate to English and to other languages. So I, I don't, I don't think that there is going to be any problem to help. Uh, of course, three hours maybe is yes. <laughs> quite a lot. Maybe we're going to take a few months, but uh, you know, uh, at the end, it's going to worth it. Fantastic. Thank you, Yeru. Yeah, excellent. Okay. So, all right, Jake. Well, um, I think we'll probably, you know, move on from this. But uh, as always, you know, with all of our guests, you are very much welcome to stay with us uh, for the next hour or so, uh, you know, for the rest of Globusters um, and comment if you want to or, you know, 
however you want to handle it, but you're certainly more than welcome to stay with us if you want. All right, fantastic. Well, I think I'll I'll bow out here then, and uh, and thank you guys for having me on the show. Uh, I appreciate your time and and letting me to speak about the film, and uh, and thank you everybody for uh, tuning in and, and listening to a little bit about the journey of putting it together. And and one last time, you can find it on nystv.org, and if you sign up with promo code Flat Earth, all under caps, one word, you can get a month free to watch it. All right, beautiful. Thank you so much, Jake. Uh, we're we're very happy you joined us, and I uh, appreciate you being here. And go ahead, Jaron. I knew you were going to say something. No, I was just saying thanks. That uh, you know, it kept me very interested throughout the whole thing. And you know, sometimes it's hard to do with a three-hour film. I can I've been known to bow out and say, okay, I can't take this anymore. But no, it was great. The whole entire thing is uh, well worth watching. So I recommend it to everybody. And thanks for joining us on the show. Thank you very much. All right, guys, have a great broadcast, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Okay. Cheers, Jake. Very nice. Wow. Great guy. Uh, I, I really like him. He's, uh, he's very well-spoken, and uh, I can see why John Pounders is so fond of him over on uh, Now You See TV. <laughs> really great. So, Iru, so, what's happening, brother? Uh, well, I'm here in Switzerland still. Uh, I'm going to get back to my country tomorrow. So here it's raining. It's a little... It's a little warm, but um, with uh, with some cold. I don't know how to to express in English that combination. But um, okay. nice, nice here at the ten past twenty uh, in the night. Uh, so I was um, visiting uh, another another country near to the frontier of um, uh, of Basel, which is a city here in Switzerland. We went to a uh, French part uh, called Istanbul, uh, Istanbulger, Istanbul, something, Shastbrook. Uh, well, the pronunciation here is a little strange, but what's nice, uh, we visit, you know, we visit an astronomical clock, of course, inside of a cathedral. And one of the, it was a little funny because you can see inside of the, of this cathedral, you can see Jesus and Besides Jesus, uh, to the side, Copernicus, <laughs> and all the <laughs> clock. I, uh, yeah, no, no. I, I was, uh, I, 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 I taking photographs and videos, you know, things like that. But it's really <laughs> an really complex astronomical clock. Uh, of course, based in a heliocentric model, a lot of calculations. But they, they get more, uh, you know, more effort. In, in constructing that astronomical clock inside the cathedral. I'm talking about like, uh, you know, really big clock, like maybe 20 to 30 meters uh, tall and like uh, 10 meters wide uh, with all this, you know, machinery inside. And of course, the, the picture of uh, Copernicus and, you know, a Latin text uh, describing his amazing work and contribution. And of course, something that come my attention is because outside of this uh, cathedral was like a pile of stones with like a tiny demon. No, you, you know, I, I cannot describe very accurately because my English, but it, it was like, a, you know, where the people go and sit to relax and see the cathedral from outside. Um, and there was like a tiny, tiny demon there. And it says, well, this stone um, talks about the builders of the cathedral and you know in, in the, to the left of this uh, tiny demon was a compass and to the right was a uh, square and it talks about the mason and something that I'm start thinking was like supposedly these guys are you know opposite to the church but they construct the churches and the cathedrals right. so they construct for the enemies <laughs> I don't know if you understand what I'm trying to say. No, I get it completely, what you're trying to say. That's uh, that's amazing. Yeah, there are there are all the places, you know. Oh, if you start studying a little bit deeply the, the history behind the Freemasonry, at least my opinion is that it was infiltrated very quickly, if not was created directly by the church, because the, the hell... The, um, uh, the the Helene, I, I don't know which is the name of the Hel Hel Wells. Hellenist? No, Wells, the, the guy, you know. Oh, William. H. Wells. Oh, oh H. W. Well, 
Okay. Yeah, the, that, that kind of method of, you know, controlling both eyes, they are always been there, uh, you know, like in the, in the, in the politics, uh, you know, it's really, you can really see in, in, in action. But you know this is this um, the, the history about the opposite uh, between the church and the Freemasons and uh, you know if you if you follow a few historian guys uh, you can clearly see how the Jesuit controlled all the Jesuit orders. In fact, they share the same symbols. You know, the Jesuit order, the Freemasonry, and <laughs> they, they they use the the pyramid. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And and by the way, it's, you're it's speaking like, of. The, the Hegelian okay. dialect, the problem, yeah, the that's solution. exactly, 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 and and you know, creating this both eyes, you know, the cap the capitalism and the communism, but they are all controlled, and you know, if you if you, it's, it's like talking about the the Chevron symbol in the, all the space agencies, mm -hmm. like you can see, you you saying before, uh, we believe that there are out there private companies controlling the 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 space, you know. But there is a lie. They, they, they create those, uh, they put money in those private private companies, uh, but they are controlling by the same source. And for me, this uh, when you start looking into these buildings and you've paying attention to what they said inside, you can clearly see both hands, you know? Right, it's yeah. like the whole right-left, you know? It's, exactly, it's, it's, yeah. Yep. Yep, for sure. But that was that was uh, what I uh, you know doing today here. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Hey, I want to give a couple shout outs for some super chats that we received. Um, first of all, um, Stuart Green, uh, four dollars and four four ninety nine pounds, I guess. Um, he says, "I don't know what a super does, so here's five pounds." LOL. <laughs> well, it, it supports your favorite content producers and and uh, helps us carry forward with this, Stuart. So. Uh, we definitely appreciate your donation, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, we also had a $20 donation from Alias, uh, who says, you guys are great. Thank you for what you do. Uh, well, thank you so much for that, Alias. We appreciate it, and uh, we'll just keep on keeping on uh, until something gives. Uh, and it's, uh, it's kind of a slow change, but I think we're making some progress. We also uh, had one earlier, Bob, from Bob Zafaris, who was always a uh great supporter of the show so thank you very much for the super chat bob yep yeah he's always been a big supporter thank you for that uh sir and uh lastly but not leastly uh we had a 50 pound or 50 euro donation from hendrik alerts and, and i hope i'm not butchering this uh Olierts. um if i am hendrik i apologize <laughs> but i think uh, it's over but that's the way i say it in my head at least alerts alerts okay oh okay close enough all right but thank Could you so wait. much for that hendrick we we definitely appreciate your support thank you so much all right cool all right so um i guess moving on and and i guess we're going to kind of uh, abbreviate this because i don't want to you know run too terribly far over today i know jaren is not feeling wonderful and uh you know iru's uh uh got some some uh, saying goodbye to do to uh, his girlfriend there in switzerland <laughs> but uh I wanted to cover a little bit um, about, you know, the title of the show, um, Why Do Astrophysicists Ignore Physics? And, you know, I'm going to give some uh, abbreviations, you know, basically on this, uh, make it a little bit abbreviated. But uh, the first thing I wanted to point out was this particular video right here that I mirrored, um, and it was put up by YouTuber Chris UK and John Smith Globly. Uh, whose name is Harry, and uh, they kind of worked on this uh, collaboratively. Uh, Chris did all the math, and the you know he it was his brainchild essentially, and uh, John Smith Globly helped out in the you know production of this. And uh, in my opinion, it was a fantastic team effort. Um, and if you haven't seen it, I did mirror it uh, on Globusters a couple days ago, and it's doing very well. Um, it's it's absolutely an amazing amazing video, but. Essentially, what he has done here is he has gone into vector mathematics and done the vector addition uh, figures showing not only the math behind what's going on with the so-called you know, ISS orbits, which we have questioned on a number of occasions, um, you know, like, you know, for example, how is it that it always keeps the bottom of the ISS, you know, face towards the Earth? 
Um, you know, that would require you know, actually quite a bit of thrust on a continuous basis. But, you know, it, how do they compensate for all the other crazy motions um, that they're doing? And of course, the mainstream answer is, of course, it, it's retarded, frankly. It is, well, it's all in the same frame of reference. And it's like, yeah, frame of reference, whatever. Um, you know, the problem is, is that as the Earth, uh, as the ISS is going around the Earth, and he points this out very clearly, the Earth, of course, is traveling in all these other crazy motions. And, you know, the explanation of, well, it's all the same frame of reference, it doesn't cut it. Um, because the fact is, there is an absolute motion, supposedly, right, of the Earth going 67,000 miles an hour uh, in its orbit around the Sun. There is a motion, and, and by the way, if it didn't matter, it was all this, you know, same frame of reference, why would it even be documented, you know, if it's all relative? Why, you know, what is the point? Uh, but you've also got the motion of the uh, sun around the Milky Way, uh, uh, and, and that's going at nearly a half a million miles an hour. And then you have the Milky Way traveling around the Great Attractor at 1.3 million miles an hour. I mean, you know, I, it just makes me think of space balls when they go into ludicrous speed, right? <laughs> and And yet they don't ever want to, you know, they don't want to treat this as anything other than a flat, you know, stationary model, right? Just like all the other government documents. Isn't it amazing? They do all their math based on, uh, you know, something that is flat, something that is stationary, uh, when in fact the math should be so contradictory to it, and then they justify it by calling it a frame of reference, which is utterly ludicrous. And anybody that buys that, frankly, needs to have their head examined, right? So, so again, this is what's going on. You know, why do they do this? Why, when it comes to astrophysics, why, when they relate things to outer space, do all the laws change, right? Why is it when they apply gravity and gravitational laws, you know, that, that you know, Newton came up with and, and other people have expanded on, why is it when they apply these things to things out in space, they don't ever add up, right? So what do they do uh, in order to justify it? Um, they invent crazy things that are unobservable, not there, uh, but because of the fact that their math demands that something has to explain it, um, because their, you know, the, the, the physics that we can prove here on Earth don't seem to support their conclusions, um, then they just start making things up. And, and these people, guys, are astrophysicists, right? They're, they're supposedly, you know, up to PhD level in physics, and they should understand this stuff full well. And they should also understand that, that calling something a frame of reference doesn't change the fact that it would allegedly be speeding around at 1.3, half a million, 1.3 million, half a million, 67,000 miles an hour and 1,037 uh, miles an hour all, all at the same time. You know, that's just, you know, out the window. They completely ignore it. So... You know, I see this as a huge problem, and, and this is only scratching the surface. But uh, first of all, uh, Iru and Jaron, did you get a chance to see this? And if so, what did you think of it? Yeah, I saw it. I think it's uh, great. It's, you know, it's a lot like my video, Are We Spinning? It, you know, uh, this is obviously much higher level. Mine was more of a, you know, dumbed down kindergarten kind of uh, explanation. But um, I think it's obvious that, you know, it's like you said, Bob, that they have a dogmatic worldview. Uh, that they can't get away from. So, you know, sometimes their answers make sense. A lot of times they don't, but they're kind of trapped in the fact that they have to answer something. And so it just so happens that we're trying to break that apart and show people that it's uh, it's not fundamentally sound. How about you, Hiro? Um, I start looking at it, uh, but because I'm here, I'm, I'm still here, uh, you know, my, my time here is not so um, dedicated to to see videos and um, especially because I am in the end of the trip so uh, I'm start looking into it and when I'm start looking you know this this kind of things uh, with a lot of number and calculations and vectors and things like that um, because maybe you know I see so much of this thing at the beginning when I start research flat earth is like uh, yeah okay uh, the, the the earth is still 
and all this kind of math is just uh, you know uh, trying to explain things that you never gonna see it and it's like Jenan says uh, always says you know it doesn't matter if they change the speed in twenty uh, percent or you know or, or, or change the distance to the sun because in outer space you don't have um, consequences uh, in your errors or calculations or assumptions or you know no right now the sun is much bigger than we thought and you know that kind of thing uh, maybe with the people that really loves the the, the numbers uh, there are great um, and in fact it's great it's a, it's a great analysis and, and a great video but I don't you know dedicate so much time because uh, uh, it's like um, you know go a little back and uh, and I, I, in my mind, the Earth, you know, it's complete still, and I don't need any more numbers <laughs> to analyze. Uh, I see what he's saying. To it. It's, if you live on a flat Earth, and you need to tell people that they don't, that they live on a spinning ball that's flying through space, that's orbiting the sun, that's you know orbiting the you know Milky Way, that's orbiting the great attractor. Think of all the nonsense that needs to go along with that. So that's what we get. You know, that's what you get. Is it you? Uh, yeah. If you're and, 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 you're not moving and and everything seems to show itself that way, but you need to convince a populace that that's not true. Well, there's a boatload of just bullshit, as uh, Ira would say, that you know goes along with it that we have to sift through. Well, once you recognize that it's bullshit, the sifting through can kind of uh, go to the wayside for a lot of a lot of practical uh, purposes. Exactly, and in fact, uh, the, the the real thing for me it's okay. All that numbers put into a mechanism or into a machine and show me that you are, you are able to detect it. So all the experiment that supposedly uh, will produce to was produced to detect the, the earth motion, they are all null. And right. in fact, they, they all, all uh, because there is a still a chalkboard, you know, a blackboard uh, doing numbers. Okay, pass those numbers to reality, to, to a mechanism, to a machine, to some kind of, uh, you know, uh, instrumental that show us that result because that is science and the only thing that these guys can you know no i'm, to, I'm not talking about the author of the of the video i'm talking about the the, the official science uh those guys uh, the only thing that they can do to support their model is just uh writing numbers on the blackboard uh, nothing more because when they transfer that to a reality to a mechanism to trying to detect that <laughs> you don't have that result yeah absolutely true and, and, you know, they, they ignore things, uh, you know, like we've talked about it many times. You know, we did the whole Coriolis discussion that has come up. You know, they will constantly come back and they will try and obfuscate and, you know, confuse people by using uh, demonstrations that use an inertial frame of reference for something that clearly requires a non-inertial frame of reference, right? And, you know, we've covered this many times before. I'm not certainly not going to go back into it again. But, but that's the kind of utter nonsense they do. They completely obfuscate it. And, um, you know, another good example uh, was, you know, what I was talking about uh, last week and even the week uh, before. And I know, uh, Jaron, you weren't here. But um, I've made the point about angular size, right? Uh, being able to see certain things and, you know, the whole 93 million miles to the sun uh, and we have the 0.52 degrees angular size. And then I went through it and I went, you know, to eight, uh, 16 light minutes, 32, one light hour, two light hours, four light hours. And by the time I got to 16 light hours, you know, which is uh, two thirds of the length of a day, the angular size was five times smaller um, than what our uh, size resolution or a visual acuity, I should say, should ever be able to register. And right. you know, I have to say that I'm 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 impressed because one of the one of the ballers who who has a degree, uh, supposedly a PhD in mathematics, confirmed my math 100%. Awesomeness, right? <laughs> but what this nutsack totally failed to acknowledge was that. The, you know, even though he admitted it, uh, he completely failed to work the numbers through as far as the inverse square law and the brightness of the equation. And that's something that I was going to kind of go into in more depth today, but I think I want to wait till we have a little bit more uh, time uh, to do that. But um, I want to show you guys some stuff that's really interesting, you know, that actually relates to that. And this is kind of cool. First thing I want you guys to see 
Um, and, and by the way, if you haven't seen this, uh, this globe ISS constant velocity, no way. Check it out, absolutely. Uh, Chris UK does such a brilliant job of exposing this, complete with the math and common sense and demonstrations that are, are really out of this world. I think he does a fantastic job of doing this. It just puts it away. I mean, it's, it's bad enough what he does to the globe, but you know, when you apply this vector math to the ISS, um, there is no way that these astronauts would not be pegged up against the wall, you know, uh, under such incredible g-force that, um, you know, it, it just boggles the mind, right? So um, he's done a really, really fabulous job in that, and uh, something very much worth watching. So, okay, so, oops, God, I've got a fly in here bugging me. So let me go, and let's look at a couple of things. First of all, uh, this is something that we have talked about several times, okay, the inverse square law. And basically, uh, what it means is that the, the specified physical quantity or intensity, as in, you know, light brightness, right, or RF power, or anything like that that is uh, electromagnetic in nature, is inversely proportional to the square of the distance from the source of that physical quantity. So what does that mean? So if you want to visualize it, Wiki actually did a halfway decent job of, of you know, providing a graphic that kind of gives you an idea of what's going on here. So if you have a source light, for example, all right, and, you know, it could be the sun, it could be one of our portable sun, little 6,500 lumen flashlights that both Jaron and I have, um, you know, something like that, and you will have a specific uh, intensity uh, of the light. And if, like I said, for example, our, our flashlight 6,500 lumens, okay? Then, you can take it out to a specific uh, distance, okay? And it will have a, another figure, okay, of, of what the, that should be in intensity or lumens. And then when you double that distance, essentially you can see what's happening here and you can see why this whole thing kind of comes back to um, it being an inverse square type of relationship. So as you can see the beam diverging out, obviously you would have less and less intensity uh, as compared to the center focal point of that beam, right? You can see it uh, diverging out. And of course that same amount of light energy then has to uh, you know, cover its divergent uh, area that it's going out. So as it goes through space, it gets wider and wider, it gets weaker and weaker um, you know, as, it, as it propagates along. And thus they have come up with the inverse square law which I don't think is entirely accurate. In fact, I think that it would be, it would fall off even greater than this, uh, you know, especially in certain conditions. But, you know, this is a, a fairly good rule of thumb and, you know, it serves us very well mathematically and also in um, practical example. All right, so, um, you know, I have a couple things here that I looked at and, and you know, for example, I said, well, you know, how bright is a, a full moon? And also, how bright is the sun? Well, daylight, you know, this guy here says daylight is 10,000 to 25,000 lux. Moonlight is about one lux. And I got to tell you, it doesn't matter whether you go to Quora or you go to NASA or you go to Wiki. Everybody has a different answer on this, which to okay. me is mind-boggling, right? Did you, did you experience that at all, Jaron, when you were searching for light intensities? A little bit, and that's why ultimately I, I made up one because... I mean, <laughs> I mean, if you go back and look at my video where I'm talking about the moonlight is once I realized that it didn't matter which figure you put in there, right? It doesn't matter if it's a 10,000 lux or if it's a 1,000 lux or if it's a one or I was using lumens at the time. It doesn't matter because the factoring ends up the same. So you could start out and say, well, let's pretend that the moon is 1 million lumens. And then you start doing the number as you get closer or further away from the moon you're going to end up with the same factor difference at the end, no matter what number you put at the beginning. So once I realized that, yeah, because when you look around, you can't find a consistent, uh, you're not going to find somebody who's going to tell you, this guy says it's one lux. I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I think I saw lots of different claims. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, whatever. But it doesn't really matter. I mean, you can take the biggest value for daylight or whatever, um, and still, when you start actually doing the math and the calculations on this, the bottom line is, is there is no way that it can be seen uh, even up to a light year. Uh, and as I, you know, demonstrated, uh, you know, last week and the week before about angular size, 
Um, you know, by the time you get to just simply two-thirds of a light day, the angular size of the sun is way too small. Now, does that mean that you wouldn't be able to see the light? Uh, well, not necessarily. Obviously, that would, fact, that would depend entirely on the initial brightness of that light in the first place. This is why, um, you know, people like the nutsack that, that did the uh, evaluation of my particular video and math, uh, even though he agreed completely with my math, he, uh, he completely ignored the inverse square calculations that would go along with it. And that's something, by the way, that is kind of a sneak preview, I'm going to tell you right now, is going to be what uh, my presentation is going to be about in Dallas. Uh, and we're going to get very much, very deeply into that. And I'm going to actually be working with a PhD uh, in this particular field that has a degree, a PhD, in a field that is very, very closely related um, to what we're doing here. Um, so that, uh, you know, people can't just say, well, it's that idiot flat earther and he doesn't know what he's doing. So um, I'm going to I'm going to back up. Uh, you know, I'm going to do all the work initially and then I'm going to have my work checked by a Ph.D. level uh, physicist and, you know, we'll go forward from there. But so getting back to the point, um, you know, you get these different Lux figures and we'll just, you know, when we do something, we'll, we'll work with this 10,000 daylight. Uh, and also I want to stress that. When they give these things, these these figures are typically in a unit of per meter squared, okay? Which means that obviously it's not the total, um, you know, light uh, because you have to take into consideration, especially when you're looking at reflective bodies or, you know, the bodies, you have to also put it over, uh, you know, what it would be uh, over the entire body. Uh, like, for example, the sun is hitting the moon, so you can't necessarily just take one small portion of that. You have to take the cumulative uh, number, which of course, like I said, really in the large uh, grand scheme of things makes almost no difference whatsoever, especially when you start going out into light days, light weeks, light months, light years. Uh, and once you get past light years, forget about it. I don't care what the numbers are, they just don't fly. All right, and I'm gonna demonstrate that very clearly. But so, and then you'll also find that there's a lot of obfuscation around brightness and, you know, lots of different scales, uh, lots of different ways to look at it. Um, they will say ridiculous things. Like if you look at sunlight, you get stupid shit like this that says, sunlight takes about 8.3 minutes to reach Earth from the surface of the sun. A photon starting at the center of the sun and changing direction every time it encounters a charged particle would take between 10,000 and 170,000 years to get to the surface. <laughs> oh my God. I mean, no, that's, Bob, that's fact. Come on. <laughs> No I mean, but you are, you are assuming that calculations in the light being because be, you know the light sometimes has this gender problem because sometimes uh, she believes it's particles sometimes she believes it's waves so <laughs> it, it has some kind of problem with the identity so I don't know in your calculation what what you are assuming Bob if the light if <laughs> in fact travel in the vacuum uh, I I mean. <laughs> Well, if I'm going to stay consistent with science, then I would say I can assume whatever the hell I want to, right? <laughs> right. Oh, of course, and, man. And yeah. if you want, you can add chocolate and cream. You could. Okay. <laughs> exactly. So, for example, let's do, let's look at, the, you know, give you an idea of kind of how this works. So, I have this handy dandy little inverse uh, square law calculator which by the way works both ways, which is kind of cool. Um, you can actually do it backwards like what you were doing, uh, Jaren. Um, this, this calculator will actually do that. So it's a little app that you can download and install. Um, oh, because cool. ironically, the online calculator that I used, uh, that I was going to use, I couldn't believe this. I started using it and then just before, uh, I, I'd been using it all week and then last night, last night, they took the calculator part out of the web page that I was going to use. <laughs> I was just sitting there going, are you Wait. serious? <laughs> that sounds like. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. I mean, you know, maybe I'm conspiratorial. That was, you know, that was a huge coincidence, but I thought it was pretty bizarre. It wasn't so, on Earth uh, Null School, right? No, no, it wasn't Earth at Null School. <laughs> <laughs> They've been known to take down a tool or two. Yeah, yeah, that they have. So, Anyway, so let's say we have a, let's use their figures, okay, and we 
took the original measurement distance, which is 93 million miles. Of course, we know what we're talking about here. It's allegedly the distance to the sun. And we put in that 10,000 lumen figure. Now, it doesn't matter what you use, lumen, lux, whatever, because it is an inverse square relationship. Therefore, this calculator doesn't give a crap what the actual uh, unit is. They're all going to be the same thing. So if we look at this and we say, okay, at 93 million miles, I took a 10,000 lux measurement. Uh, and now I want to know how does that look? How bright is that at 1 billion miles away? Well, all of a sudden now we have gone from 10,000 lux down to 86.5 uh, lumens, excuse me. Lumens or lux, whatever I, whatever the, it was. Lux. Yeah, 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 lux, okay. So, and this, a billion miles, guys, is nothing astronomically, right? Because a light year is like 5.8 septillion miles, is that right? A light year? Yeah, a light year. 25 trillion. Yeah, 25 trillion or, okay, okay, 25 trillion miles. All right, that's right. 25 trillion miles is a light year. So a billion miles is nothing, right? And already at a billion miles, we've taken that really bright 10,000 uh, lumens, right? Or lux or whatever it is. And it, it has been reduced down to almost nothing, you know, in a mere billion miles. And if you keep taking this out, so let's let's kind of give you an idea. So let's just say we took something and measured it at one mile. And let's say, well, let's leave that 10,000 in there, right? And let's say that we increase that to 10 miles, all right? We hit the calculate it. So now we've gone from uh, measuring at one mile uh, to 10 miles at 10,000 lux lumens, whatever. And it's dropped us down to 100 lux lumens, whatever. All right. Now let's increase that to 100 miles. Let's hit calculate it. Oh, look at that. It's gone down to one, right? So, and of course, if we go to 1,000 miles, now it's, now it's going into the 0 0.01. Now it's becoming fractionalized. Uh, it, it's utterly crazy. So, you know, you're getting the idea of what's going on here, right? So it, it is decreasing inversely um, to the square of the distance, or, or excuse me, it's decreasing inversely. Oh, God. All right. <laughs> I'm screwing myself up. That is up. why I, know I don't like the numbers. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's decreasing to the square of the distance inversely, all right, to the light intensity. So you, you see what's going on here. I'm sorry. An easy, way, an easy way to show that is if you put 100 into the first box, the original measurement, just put 100 there in the distance and then 100 in the lumens, the next, uh, no, the top box on the right, just put 100 there too. Okay. Just because you can show it, it, it will reduce by a quarter. And then if we're going to do half that distance, so now do uh, 50 is the new measurement. So now we're at 50 miles. So because we halved our distance, then the original measure is going to end up four times. See, so it's four. Four hundred. Four hundred. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, so, it works backwards. Right. It's just an easy way to show that it it is that inverse to the square. Um, you know, Either which way. is half the distance, and you you know you need to multiply by four, or if you uh, double the distance, then you would. So go ahead and put in four hundred on the uh, bottom right, and you were going to see that instead on the over there, it's going to be point two five to calculate 6.25 right because remember this is the original measurement distance right right so you know so that yeah that just shows people that when you um yeah half it or double it you multiply by or divide by four exactly so and that's the whole thing right so not only do we have to consider the angular size and how it's reducing um but you also have to take the square of that distance and reduce it by that amount, right, as far as light intensity. And this is the one thing that they don't, you know, don't want to go there. And like I said, when I showed the pictures of those mainstream sources of what the sun would look like from as far as Pluto, and, you know, thank goodness there are some places that still actually have integrity, they admitted point blank, well, from Pluto, the sun would look no bigger than any other star, right? And how far away is Pluto? I don't know. It's 
I don't know, is it a billion miles or whatever? I'm not sure how far away it is, but it doesn't matter. It's in the solar system. And so that's the thing you've got to ask yourself. Then when you're talking about <laughs> reflection, right, of and, and us being able to see these planets because supposedly they're not lit up on their own, yeah, right, but they are supposedly reflecting light. Well, then you have to get into things to consider like what is their albedo, uh, what is their reflective capability, right? And then after you have taken and, and reduced not only the angular size of the sun, but also uh, taken the inverse square law of, of the intensity of the light that reaches it, then you have to apply the albedo to see how much light you're going to get reflected right off of it. And then from that figure, you have to come all the way back from, let's say, Pluto to Earth right? Uh, another, you know, several hundred million <laughs> miles. And when you do that, people, I mean, and we're only talking about our solar system here, right? Only, you know, a couple light hours at max. There is no freaking way that you would ever be able to see any planets um, and, and clearly not even any stars. And, you know, when I do this presentation in Dallas, I'm going to take the biggest, baddest, star that's ever been discovered and all of its alleged light capabilities and we're going to look at it both backwards and forwards and what you're going to find is that when you look at the required light output to be able to see some of these stars uh, it goes beyond a law of physics that deals with light limitations right so again the physicist astrophysicist absolutely disregard their own physics laws because they have to make this fit the narrative, right? It's, it's ridiculous. It's crazy. Can we put in real quick, Bob, on that same calculator? Um, sure. Just put in the 240,000 miles of the moon right there in the first box. Okay. So two the zero, 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 and then put in one lux there. So just the number one. Okay. And then a new distance of uh, one. So to be at one mile, so let's say we're right above the moon at one mile above it, you know, 5,000 feet. That's <laughs> <laughs> how bright it would be. So, yeah. yeah. So what is that? Uh, thousand, million. Billion. 57. Billion, trillion. 57.6 trillion, right? Uh, wow. That right? Thousand, million. Yeah. Billion. Yeah. But but they they can <laughs> adjust the the aperture of the camera to take photos on the moon. And if it's not if it's not if it's any problem, Nvidia, they that that guys came and oh, produced an algorithm to render right. an image to compute all you know the fantastic uh, to and they'll prove um, Nvidia yeah. Nvidia is good at it. Plus Nvidia they, can do it. They had shields on their helmets. Yeah, <laughs> completely. <laughs> they can adjust the, the aperture of the of the camera to take pictures, you know, on the moon, but they cannot adjust to taking picture of the stars from the moon. Right. Or from the space, asked, even I, in 2019. When we say, why can't you see stars in the picture, they should just tell us, well, they couldn't even see each other. It was so bright. <laughs> stars. Exactly. So anyway, that's, you know, that's kind of the point here, guys, is, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, these and these these are not this isn't complex math. This isn't a complex concept, you know, to have something, you know, to have size that is inversely proportional to distance. That's a piece of cake. You know, if you double the distance to something, the size is going to be cut in half. If you have the distance the, to the object, then the size is going to be doubled. Right. And the inverse square law, uh, even though it gets a little confusing when you're trying to apply it, um, it's still very, very straightforward as to how it works. But I just find it interesting and amazing that, you know, people that have PhDs in mathematics or, you know, whatever, are such nutsacks, they can't even extrapolate it out and see what the problem is as to why you cannot broadcast a signal, you know, a billion miles, especially when it starts at 20 watts, um, and you know things like that. It it just absolutely boggles the mind, truly. And then you get you always get the people who will try and bring up that it's a reflection that we don't understand the inverse square law because the light off the moon is reflected, the light off the planets is reflected, the light, and that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's the same thing whether it's the source light 
or the reflection because you're measuring the actual light output. You know, if it's reflecting off the moon, it still follows the inverse square law. It doesn't matter that that light is coming from somewhere else. It's the same thing. Yes, absolutely. So, again, there's another thing. So, uh, it seems like gravity, distances, angular sizes, uh, light intensity, RF intensity, you know, again, I, I, I laugh at this. I've used this example before, but I absolutely die every time I think about it. Uh, you know, when you have the chief project engineer for Voyager, right, talking about, uh, yeah, this little 20-watt signal about the power of a refrigerator light broadcasting well over a billion miles, right, or several billion miles. And by the time it gets here, it's one ten trillionth of a billionth of a watt. I mean, for crying out loud. And you know what? I haven't even checked to see if that's true uh, because it may or may not be. Uh, but it's so preposterous that it really would have to make you think. It's like, so So what special law of physics is then is allowing us, uh, you know, what are you conjuring up to allow us to be able to receive that signal out of the noise floor, right? Uh, <laughs> it's, just, it's just utterly ridiculous. So we have things like that that are going on. Um, there's so many examples that it, it, it literally blows the mind, uh, you know, and and I, this is why, you know, I wanted to talk about it. Why is it that science, how do people actually get degrees in these fields and not understand the most basic, the most elementary of concepts that should be understandable to any junior high uh, science student, right? It's just crazy. It's called UNESCO. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. And well, it's it clearly and a failure of the educational system, right? <laughs> Completely. Yep. Completely. Yes, because they have not uh, been able to, uh, you know, indoctrinate us properly. So that's really what it comes down to. So, you know, that's kind of the point. A uh, couple other things that I want to mention really quick, um, Jaren, uh, was your interview this week. And guy, by the way, guys, I will cover this more in depth. We got a little. Uh, carried away with Jake Grant, although I'm not, I'm not sorry about it at all. He was a fabulous guest, and we had some great information on it. But uh, unfortunately, it ran a little bit long, so I won't be able to cover it as quite as in depth. So I just kind of give you the outline and the sneak preview about uh, you know, you know what I'm going to be doing presentation on anyway in Dallas and uh, maybe even in uh, South Carolina as well. But uh, I, I wanted to talk a, a little bit about, Jaren, your uh, interview with Charlie Robinson, who apparently lives here in Denver. And uh, you and David were talking to him, and uh, he is the author of the book called The Octopus of Global Control, which I have not read. But uh, he struck me as an incredibly insightful and intelligent man, and uh, he seemed to be surprisingly open-minded to the idea. So uh, you want to tell, tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, no, it was great. Everybody should check it out um, and read the book. I haven't read it either, uh, but I do want to check it out. Uh, David brought me to you know the attention of this guy from uh, being on with Mel Fabregas on Veritas Radio. And uh, hearing that two-hour conversation was just awesome. And I said, man, this guy's completely open-minded. And I know David had talked to him in the past, and he had said that he just hadn't looked into Flat Earth. And he said, yeah, if you guys ever want to have a conversation and just talk about it, you know, let me know. So uh, David hooked up with him and we uh, were on my channel and just, yeah, it was great to have an open-minded guy. He wouldn't quite go as far as to say that uh, he thinks the earth is flat, but I think that's what you're dealing with a lot of these guys that even when they're heavy conspiracy theorists uh, who have written books on it and everything, that, that next step is a little bit tough. But uh, if you listen to the interview, you'll see he's very open to all the ideas and doesn't trust NASA, doesn't trust anything that we're getting sold by uh, the American government for sure and all these space agencies certainly doesn't think anybody went to the moon and I think that uh, it's just a great conversation to have and he was very open to all the ideas and that's all that we expect I just want people to uh, look at it take it take it into consideration uh, think about it and, and you know make up your own mind but a lot of us have been so conditioned uh, from birth really to buy into these lies that we're told and I think it goes along well even with the you know, the movie, What If the Earth is Flat? So definitely check it out. Charlie Robinson seems like a great guy. I'd love to hang out with him uh, if I ever went to Dallas again. I mean, Denver. Yeah, awesome. Well, well I hope so. Um, well, 
at least if I'm here, otherwise <laughs> it'll probably be North Carolina for us. But uh, yeah, he, I, maybe I'll get a chance to hook up with him before we leave. But uh, did he say whether or not he was considering going to Dallas? I think he said he's got something going on in Vegas uh, the same time or something. So I'm not positive. I think David did, uh, you know, kind of open it up to him that if he wanted to come, he's welcome. But uh, I think he said he had something going on, if I remember correct. So uh, maybe in the future. But uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to reading his book. One of the things, the questions I had, because he talked a lot about it. And basically the reason it's called an octopus of global control is he was talking about these eight arms of the octopus that control uh, reality and control life and control this world and the people in it. And, uh, you know, one of those tentacles did happen to be science. And, and really we can see that now taking hold more than ever with, uh, you know, all the science funding coming from basically government and, uh, political reasons and them having to hold to the status quo. And, you know, he talked a lot about that and just what they can do. I mean, with these global warming scares and everything else that, uh, uh people believe in because science says so, um, so we talked a lot about that and it was a great interview. I enjoyed it. Excellent. Yeah, I really did too. I thought he was fabulous. So kudos on that interview and that was uh, super. All right. Yeah. And, nice, nice interview. Yep. For sure. Thank you. Thank you. Drew. Okay. And before we move on, I, I wanted to say guys that, um, the global lie tour, um, which, uh, Jaron, you had an opportunity to be part of, that was kind of cool seeing you out there flat smacking people. <laughs> um, that was fun. <laughs> definitely. They could definitely use our help. I, you know, I think it is a great cause. Um, we did a, you know, kind of a fundraiser to get our sticker on the, on the bus and everything. But by the way, that looks super cool um, that it's on there. But uh, they definitely could still use our help. And so what I have done is I have put a PayPal link uh, down in the description of the show. It's already there uh, right now. So if you would like to help out Roxanne and, and, uh, Jason and all the, you know, the gang that are out there, you know, on the streets doing the job, you know, trying to, to bring our message to the world, um, you know, please, please go and uh, throw them a few bucks and uh, they did help them out a lot. Um, I think with uh, the amount of people that watch the show and uh, are invested in Flat Earth in some way, this is a really good way to spend your money to support this project. And uh, yeah, um, I'm definitely going to be throwing another donation at them here very shortly even though I've already done it, but I, I truly believe um, their their cause is worthwhile. And I'm looking forward to doing it a little bit myself in Dallas as well. Bob, I, I had to gasp when I heard uh, what gas prices are over there. You know, I know they're driving a motorhome, so I knew that gas was, you know, you know I'm sure a motorhome uses a lot more gas than in your normal car. And uh, I was kind of talking to them and, and saying, oh, if we ever came to the States, it would be so expensive because of the gas prices. And they kind of laughed me out of the building. Um, how much is gas where you're at, Bob, for just a you know tank of 87 or not a tank, but a gallon? Um, it's about $2.70 a gallon. It kind of fluctuates, but that's about right. Right. So here in California, it's about right now uh, about four fifty dollars uh, no a gallon. No kidding? Yeah. Wow. That's how much it is. <laughs> well, get this. In in the UK, it's like twelve dollars American a gallon. When you get this in Argentina, it's like twenty four. That's ridiculous. That's... I always thought, well, they're damn, they're closer to the damn oil. <laughs> Wouldn't they get cheaper no, prices? No, man. No, but that is not fair because you are not. Uh, you know, United States is not like uh, you, you cannot com compete with you guys because you are the owner of the bullets. So it's impossible <laughs> to compete with you. Right. I mean, I really had no idea. I thought that they paid less in gas than we do. I don't know why I thought that, oh, well, you know, we're in the United States. It's got to be the most expensive place. And I'm in California, so it's got to be the most expensive place in the world to find out that gas is nearly three times as much as I pay. I'm like, how can they even afford to do this globe light tour? And just when I learned that, I'm like, I can barely afford to drive around my town, let alone <laughs> across state lines and all over the place. So, um, yeah, if anybody's got any extra funds that they can lend them, it's not easy doing what they're doing. Traveling, what is the stupid amount of miles they're doing? 14,000 miles? Yeah. Something? That's just ridiculous. Uh, even the gas alone is going to be uh, insane. So I don't know how true that is. That's what Gary told me as far as the gas price. It's a little bit weird. It's hard to figure out because they go by liters. We go by gallons. So, But I think from what I heard, it's about three times as much as we pay here in California. Wow. And yeah, and you're paying a lot more than we are in Colorado. Of course, we have, you know, we have a few refineries here. 
which is interesting because they bring it here to refine it. God knows why. It's not like we have oil wells all over the place, but um, so <laughs> I guess because of that, you know, gas is just a lot cheaper here. But yeah, it's about two seventy a gallon, uh, which you know I'm thinking my lucky stars for that right now. Holy smokes! I so. still remember when I lived there in, in uh, Colorado Springs at that time. And what, what year was that? 2001. Uh, there was gas at the, let me see, Diamond Shamrock, right? Is that the name of the gas mm-hmm. station there? Yep. Yeah. See, we don't have any of those over here. But Diamond Shamrock was 99 cents. Those were the, the good old days. Yeah, good old days. Uh, yeah, not anymore. Um, but, yeah, it's really expensive here. So, anyway, just bringing that up about how much they're actually paying for gas to do this Globe Light tour. So, if anybody's got... Anything that they can help them out with, I know they're going to need it. And uh, I really look up to a lot to what those guys are doing. It's not easy work. You know, I enjoy, um, you know, jotting down some notes, pulling up some websites, and uh, basically sitting at my computer and talking to myself through my microphone. And people seem to enjoy that. It's a lot more difficult to actually get out there on the street and have to talk to somebody new every 10 seconds. You know, you've got, what are we going to talk about? What is this person's beliefs? Where are they at? Um, it's not easy work. That's all I can say. Yeah. Absolutely true. So, yeah. So if you guys can help out, uh, it's paypal.me forward slash globe lie euro tour. And again, the link is already in the description right now. You can go down there and just click on it. I'm sure they would appreciate your help. And uh, as would the rest of the Flat Earth community, let's get the word out. And, uh, you know, a few bucks isn't going to hurt anybody and it'll certainly help them. So excellent. All right. So next up, um, and I just saw this this morning. Um, and apparently it was just released um, today by Zetetic Flat Earth, even though he has taken this particular video uh, from this and reduced it um, from a guy named Wise Up Artisan, who has a whopping 16 subscribers, uh, put it out on September 28th. September. But this is amazing, right? And as, as David said, he, he was, he's just blown away every day. He finds something that just blows his mind. But this is incredible, the explanation that is given about the tides. And it very conclusively, uh, in my opinion, uh, shows that these tides would simply not be possible on a ball earth. Now, I know that's a huge claim, but hear it out. Go and see this. This will be in the show notes. Uh, It was uh, put up today by Zetetic Flat Earth. Of course, everybody knows him. And uh, uh, the Wise Up Artisan also has the extended view, which I have not seen the extended version but I did watch this 16-minute uh, uh, version. So I don't know if you guys saw this or not, guys, but wow, mind-blowing stuff. Yeah, I'm going to have to check it out. I just saw David post it in the uh, Globusters chat before, so I haven't seen it yet. Yep, very good. Okay, so and then I think uh, probably the last thing that I wanted to say, well, first of all, I want to give a big, huge congratulations to uh, Ben Taboo Conspiracy who had a a new little baby um, this week. So we have a brand new flat earther amongst us. uh, uh, Absolutely adorable. And honestly, I don't know if it's a boy or girl. He didn't mention. And uh, it's kind of hard to tell from a picture because, you know, you (laughs) you just can't tell when they're they're babies. So, Ben, don't know if it's a boy or girl, but uh, whatever it is, congratulations. Um, You know, I'm I'm sure you're thrilled. And uh, uh, the, the baby itself is absolutely beautiful. But... Um, so Ben, currently, the reason he is not with us today is because he is in Romania, and he was invited there to do the Flat Earth Conference, and he was nice enough to put out uh, his um, speech that he's going to be doing there. He put it in video form, and he made it uh, available for everybody, and this, it's really great because, again, David thought it was one of the best uh, Flat Earth videos he had ever seen. I have to agree. Um, As far as the way that it was put together, it's right up there in the top 10 um, for sure. And if you haven't seen it, uh, you can either see it on the Taboo Conspiracy 2 um, channel or it's on Globusters. I just mirrored it yesterday. So um, it's out there. Definitely check it out. But uh, uh, yeah, uh, I'm sure you guys saw this. What did you think about it? No, I said I haven't seen it because I watched it. Oh, you haven't uh, seen it. I'm sorry. My bad. I'm I'm seeing it. I'm going to watch it today. I watched the three-hour you know, what if the earth is flat first, but, uh, I have no fear, Ben, I will be on it, uh, today. Yep. And you what'd you think of it? Yeah, I see it and really great. Uh, the, the order, you, he, he put the things, how he, you know, 
take it into account uh, a lot of experiments and his own path. Um, I mean, it's it was great. I don't know how how was it the the conference because I was invited to, but I I, I can't um, get there. You know, for for my little time here uh, this weekend. But um, I talked with the guy who organized that. Uh, his name was Marcos, and started yesterday and today until 4 p.m. Uh, was the conference but uh, i don't i don't believe there was some kind of live feed or or i don't know if there is some official uh website to check out how how it was i don't know if you know something about it uh yeah actually very little um about what was going on. i know that that zach good times for all uh here uh with us here in denver was invited to that but um, couldn't quite pull things together to be able to make it, even though I know he really wanted to go. So uh, hopefully everything re went really well. Um, you know, Ben did say something that uh, uh, they had some great presenters there and, and uh, that, you know, from what we can tell, it went very well, but uh, don't know much of the details on it. So we'll be looking forward to hearing from him next week when he gets back and also maybe yeah. seeing some more pictures of his new little baby. Of course, uh, and the thing that is important for me, you know, if the flatter topic reach some, you know, a country like Romania, uh, and not just reach in terms of the information, but in terms of the activism and, and do this kind of conference is because <laughs> we are all around the world. Yes, as Mark Sargent says, we got people everywhere. <laughs> so, all right, beautiful. All right, so next thing up, just a couple more things, and I think we're gonna call it a show here. But I uh, wanted to mention once again that, uh, of course, uh, the today is the 6th of October, and in 14 days, um, two weeks from now, um, we have the Flattoberfest uh, conference that is taking place in Greenville, South Carolina, at a place called the Firmament. We have some fabulous guests there, of course, yours truly included. Um, but uh, Rob Skiba is uh, one of the keynote uh, presenters, um, as well as Mark Sargent, myself, uh, a couple of uh, uh, musical groups, um, and yeah, it's going to be it's going to be really good. I'm looking forward to it. It's a very inexpensive uh, forum, or uh, excuse me, uh, meetup conference, whatever you want to call it. I'm not sure what you want to call it, but uh, it's very inexpensive, and it's going to be kind of an all day long event. Should be a lot of fun. They've got a fabulous video and audio system there, and uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, so, yeah, you've got One Big Love and Twin Serpent that will both be there. And uh, uh, I really like uh, uh, a lot of the stuff, uh, for, especially from Twin Serpent. Uh, I like their music a lot. One Big Love is not bad either. Um, so, you know, um, that ought to be a really, really great conference. So, everybody, if you can get a chance to make it to South Carolina in Greenville, check it out. Um, it is on flattoberfest.com, F-L-A-T-O-B-E-R-F-E-S-T.com. And, uh, or, or you can just go, this will be in the show links, the video to it. Uh, the promo uh, will show, show you how to get uh, tickets for it and everything like that. And then, of course, that is followed up by the granddaddy of all conferences coming up November 14th and 15th in Dallas, Texas. The Flat Earth International Conference featuring Owen Benjamin, who will be doing a comedy routine there. I'm sure we're all looking forward to that. Uh, he may even take a few shots at Flat Earth, but that's okay because it's all in good fun. And, uh, you know, he is, I would bet that he's kind of a cl closet Flat Earther already. He certainly knows that the globe isn't true, and he certainly knows that NASA is full of BS. So, you know, if he isn't there already, he's certainly 90% of the way. So uh, definitely looking forward to that. Of course, we've got a ton of people that are going to be there. You can go to the website and see them all. But uh, Jaron will be there, Ear will be there, uh, Ben will be there, and I will be there. Uh, as far as representing the Globebusters, we're all going to be there. Um, we have, uh, Cammy's going to be there actually doing a presentation with Zach, Good Times for All. And they have been working really hard on their How the World Works presentation. Um, they're going to come at this from a really unique angle. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm thinking it's going to be fabulous. I can hardly wait to see it. So. There you have it. That's all I have, guys. Um, I'll go around one more time, and uh, we'll call it a show. So, uh, Ira, we'll start with you. Um, anything else you want to say about uh, where you are, what you've been doing, and uh, what's coming up? 
Um, well, um, I was here on, on Switzerland for the last two weeks. Um, of course, I came to the Amsterdam conference that it was really great. And I didn't do so much um, because I, I was enjoying other things than the um, my uh, typically, you know, <laughs> Uh, research videos. Uh, it was the, the last video that I uploaded was uh, the Mike Tyson uh, question in Flat Earth. I don't know if you saw it, uh, but that is another, you know, another uh, thing to consider. If you know, if, if guys like Mike Tyson in a radio show start talking about, uh, did, did you see it? Yeah. Oh, so yeah. I mean. Carl Carl Frosch too, right? So maybe the yes in up the boxing world, which uh, takes place in a flat ring. Exactly, but uh, for me, you know, the, it, when when, of course, there is a spreading, uh, you know, very quickly. Uh, I don't know how it's gonna work, you know, how, how it's gonna work for the elite, uh, for the church, uh, all this because of course they know uh, that we are came out and. You, you never know if something that they leave, you know, to uh, they plan to spread out of not or, or not, but th this is growing very fast. That is no doubt. And uh, but I didn't make it, you know, I, I, I didn't make it um, um, so much things in, in terms of the of my research. So I don't have too much to <laughs> to tell you. But I'm gonna be in Argentina in a few days, so I'm gonna I'm gonna try to um, uh, take again the um, my English channel because it was deleted. So I'm gonna try to make my own videos, so don't have any trouble with the uh, politics of YouTube and and keep working. All right, beautiful. Well, um, that sounds good, Eru, and and uh, I haven't checked that out. Admittedly, I will check it out. Um, uh, about uh, uh, Mike Tyson, and uh, yeah, there's just so many videos. Don't, don't, out. This, don't expect, you know, don't expect some <laughs> fabulous <laughs> words <laughs> from Mike Tyson. But you know, yeah. you need to try to. That what you know. And, and in the past, I saw an interview when uh, he talks about the Illuminati uh, economic control, mm. and you know, in in, in really in, in a really camouflage way. Because he was complaining about <clears throat> the elite and the banks are taking his money and they, they, they don't want to allow him to use in his own way. I'm talking about when he was young. In fact, there is the interview in, on the internet. But when you are still, you know, um, hearing, um, talking about that, not only the flat earth, but only, uh, but, um, about uh, the astronaut not being in the space and who the fuck knows uh, why, where, where, um, which is our purpose here on Earth. Right. That was some kind of the word that he used. So, you know, it's because he's looking into it. It's not just random words. Awesome. Okay. Well, you know, I wouldn't exactly expect a whole bunch from Mike Tyson anyway, but um, it is good that, that, Flat Earth is getting a lot of celebrity exposure, uh, and that does seem to be happening more and more and more. You know, whether you want to call it good, bad, or however they're you know portraying these people, <clears throat> you know, there is a part of me that agrees with with Mark Sargent and saying that you know any exposure is good exposure, even though a lot of the exposure um, appears to be very bad exposure. At least it's getting into the minds of people, and uh, you know, it's kind of like if you hear. Uh, it's something about a car and it, oh, how horrible this car is or whatever, um, you know, well, at least you've heard about it and you may want to go and check that car out yourself um, just to see if what everybody is saying about it is true, you know, if you're in the market. Uh, but if you hadn't heard about it, then maybe you wouldn't have even looked at it, you know, because let's face it, a lot of things that you hear on the media um, or, or in general um, is, is far from true um, in a lot of cases. And again, it comes back to you know, your own discernment, your own judgment on that. So, uh, you know, getting the word out there, I, I see a lot of, of merit in that argument uh, that uh, there may not be any bad publicity, so to speak, even though it can certainly be made to look that way. So whatever. All right. So let's move on to you, Jaron. Uh, obviously, you just got back from 
uh, Europe, and I'm sure you got a lot of things on your plate after you get well from the travel <laughs> sickness, which <laughs> appears to be really common. Yeah, no, just getting over this, and then, uh, you know, got to get ready for Dallas coming up. It'll be great to see everyone again there. So uh, we have Raw tomorrow night on TFR, and then just keep an eye on my channel this week as I'll do a kind of an Amsterdam roundup and uh, a few thank yous. And then also I'm thinking of doing something. I don't know what yet. I'm going to have to talk to a few people. But really in, in Amsterdam when, you know, Rodrigo, myself, and Iru were just sitting around and uh, conversating, I think some of those conversations are the best uh, content, you know, if we were recording everything that we talked about. So I'm going to talk with Iru and Rodrigo but uh, and a few others and see if we can do something like a – I don't know, just, you know, a show on my channel that's just a lounge kind of show where there's no real direction. We just sit around and talk. Uh, people may not like it, but I think there'll be a lot of gems that'll come from it. So I think we had some great I'm in. <laughs> you <was> in. <laughs> I'm in. Yeah, you was in. It was fun. So I think that, that people might enjoy that, and maybe others wouldn't, but uh, kind of open it up, give it a, a platform where a lot of people can just jump in and just chat, and maybe there's six, seven, eight of us um, on a call, on a Skype call. And we just call it lounging or something. Who knows? So just keep an eye on my channel. Never know what's going to happen. Awesome. I think that's a great idea. And uh, awesome. Okay. Cool. All right, guys. Well, I think that we'll call it another week. Um, we have some interesting things coming up next week. I'm not going to say what it is yet because I haven't got it set in stone. But uh, hopefully we'll have a couple of really good guests next week uh, that uh, some of you are familiar with. Um, that have been doing some really great work on some uh, documentaries that have been out lately that we've covered before. But not going to say because I don't know yet. Uh, and uh, so it's going to be kind of a surprise for you. So, all right. So stay tuned for that. And as always, guys, we really appreciate our audience and uh, all the things, all the super chats, all the ways that you support us. Uh, please go out and share the show. Um, let's spread the word. We know YouTube sure as heck isn't going to do it. And, uh, you know, we'll keep doing what we do. And, uh, you guys keep doing what you do and uh, helping us and uh, all the good things that uh, the Flat Earth community stands for. So until then, we will see you next week. Until then, be good to each other. Don't lie to each other. Open your mind because there's truth inside. Peace out, everybody. Peace. Peace. <laughs>